Welcome to the Tuesday, May 23rd, 2023 meeting of the Stoughton School Committee. This meeting is being recorded by SMAC for future broadcasting. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The first item on our agenda is the public hearing for school choice. Um, can I have a motion to open the public hearing? So moved. All right. Thank you, Chris. Second? Second. All right. The motion has been moved and seconded. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Armando? Aye. 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 All right. The motion is carried five to zero. Um, Dr. Rob, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Mrs. Weiss. There's a memo in your packet. I'll just read it out loud. According to amended Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 76, Section 12B, the Stoughton School Committee must vote each year regarding the option to participate in school choice. Now, just a little bit of background, school choice, if it was approved, would allow students from other towns to attend Stoughton. Um, it is my recommendation, however, to continue as we have done in the past, not to participate in the program for the 23-24 school year due to lack of space in our facilities. And I think it's been spoken about uh, many times, our enrollment is only growing. Thank you. At this time, do we go to public comment? All right. Is there anyone here for a public comment on school choice? All right. Hearing none. Um, can I have a motion on the table to follow the superintendent's recommendation to not participate in school choice for 2023? So moved. All right. <laughs> Chris, um, do I have a second? All right, second. Moved and seconded. I'm going to open it up for questions. Any questions um, about school choice? Lindsay? Yeah. Armando? Chris? Uh, out of curiosity, uh, Dr. Rob, it's my understanding that money would follow the students, so funding is not an issue. It, it, right? <laughs> funding is not the issue. It's just truly the space that's the issue, correct? It's a little bit of both. So okay. space is certainly the paramount issue, but while funding would follow the, the student, you only receive the per pupil expenditure. You don't receive exactly what you need, okay. so. All right, thank you. Fabian, any questions? No All right, any other questions? Any discussion or debate? All right, hearing none, <laughs> let's move to the vote. Um, so all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, so the motion to not participate in school choice for 2023 is carried five to zero. Thank you. Um, motion to close the public hearing. <laughs> so moved. All right, thank you, Chris. Second. Second. All right, thank you, Lindsay. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, the motion to, is carried five zero. This concludes the public hearing on school choice. Those of you who did not get to go to town meeting get to vote a lot tonight. So. Um, Public comment. It's the next item on the agenda. Seeing none. Okay. All right, let's move on. That takes up the page. All right, the next item on the agenda, item three, is the superintendent update. Dr. Rob. Thank you, Mrs. Weiss. In the interest of time and a jam packed agenda, I only have two things that I'd like to mention. Um, first, the, the kill deer's eggs hatched and it went <laughs> off on its merry way, so everything's fine and uh, we've taken down the barricades and, and, and everything worked out. And on a more serious note, today uh, the middle school engaged in a lockdown drill and different from, and if you're a parent you receive the notification from the principal, but different from other lockdown drills, they tried to make this one a little bit more real. And so we alerted the teachers, we alerted the students, they knew it was happening but we gave the teachers the opportunity to make some decisions. Uh, you know, if there was unfortunately an active shooter in some part of the building, part of our protocol gives the teachers an opportunity to evacuate, to barricade, to do what they feel they need to do, and have the conversation with the students about why. So it was very much a learning moment, and my understanding, Mr. Colantonio is here, but my understanding is it was very successful and uh, well received by everybody as kind of a next step in our lockdown drills, so. With those options, did you get any results with regards to which one was more effective? We have a survey out to the staff right now, so I'd be curious to see the results once we get it. Yeah. Any other questions or comments for the superintendent? All right. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Rapp. The next item in our agenda is the Student Advisory Committee 
uh, representative. I see that we have Sarah Horner, our senior advisory committee representative here today. Do you have an update for us, Sarah? So, um, yes, so this past Friday we had our student council lock-in, so that's where like, we spend the night at school with a bunch of activities. Um, but we also had our executive board elections, and so now we have a new executive board, and so next year you will have some new ladies joining you, better, unfortunately not Sam and I, but um, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions or comments for Sarah? I just want to say thank you to you and Sam for coming to these meetings. It's thank like you. It's a really cool way to be engaged in your community, and we appreciate yes. your perspective. And yes, the students love that we come too. They yeah. feel like they have a voice as well. It's definitely so. been impactful, so just want to send some appreciation thank your you. way and congratulations. Thank you. Look forward to watching you walk across the stage. I know. I was going to say, I think the next time we see you is on the stage. So Yeah, really I think excited. so. I think so. Right. I guess this is your last time here. Is that correct? I think so, yeah. All right, okay. Well, thank you. Yes. Well, thank you. Again, yes, I'm going to echo Lindsay and, and thank you and Sam for all of your work and dedication and the rest of the, the councils that have um, who have participated in our discussions. It really is helpful. And we're, Thank you. We're, I will pass that on to her as well. All right, thank you. All right, congratulations again, and I guess we'll move on to the next item. Our next item is new business. Um, the first item is the non-resident employee program. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Rab again. Thank you, Mrs. Weiss. This is another one of those votes that we take every year. The non-resident employee benefit program is an opportunity for our employees if they want to send their students to the Stoughton Public Schools, they have that opportunity. Um, there is a materials fee of $1,500 per student that the employee pays in order to help offset the cost of the additional materials. Um, we've been doing this since 2006, 2007. Attached to your um, memo is the history of the program. Currently, we have uh, three people in uh, three people enrolled, and it has been well received over the years. And so, my recommendation would be to continue it for grades pre K to twelve and the twenty three twenty four school. All right. Um, can I have a motion to continue the non resident employee benefit program? So moved. All right. Thank you, Chris. A second. Second. All right, thank you, Lindsay. Um, any questions about this program? Comments? Any questions, comments, yes. Hi, Dr. Rob. I'd just like to say um, my husband was looking at something along these lines. We've been considering this because he's a teacher, and it really would have helped us out with daycare options. So I'm really pleased that, that Stoughton is doing this. I think that helps to elevate us as an employer of choice. So thank you for this. Any other questions or comments? I do have a question. Do we have a, a limit to how many or maximum how many kids that we can accept to participate? I think it would be based on enrollment. We haven't been hit with the question, as you can see, over the years. Um, we've had, you know, five, six mm -hmm. at most. Prior to the pandemic, we had seven or eight. Mm -hmm. I think it would really depend on the enrollment. You know, we'd have to be careful with that. But it, it, to my understanding, and, and Mr. Ford may have more information, it, it hasn't become an issue over the years. So I can speak to this because my kids did attend the Stoughton Public Schools. And uh, the school that would have been most convenient for me, uh, driving in to drop my kids off, pick them up on the way home, was in fact full. So I wasn't able to put my kids in that school. And we actually looked to see where the enrollment was the lowest. So, so when people are in fact enrolling their kids, if, if they're in a school where there is high enrollment, there is a conversation there. And if, if we need to make adjustments, we will. I don't think we have that situation right now. Uh, with any of our teachers bringing their kids in but if we needed to we would and if the numbers got too big it's it's another conversation when we bring it to the committee do we have like a policy or process in place if that would happen we haven't had to at this point there is an application so they do have to fill out an application so if we found after we received the applications that it was a burden that we couldn't handle we would bring it back to the committee. so it'd be like a waiting list or something like that a first come first serve okay any other questions or comments Lindsay, All right, and are we ready for a vote? All right, um, all in favor? Lindsay? Aye. 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 All right, I declare that a motion carried five to nothing. So that one's done. And the next item on our agenda is the, are the school improvement plans. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Rabb to introduce our principals and our other guests to speak on this. This is one of my favorite parts of the year, so. 
Thank you, Ms. Weiss, members of the committee. I'm very pleased to have our principals here and one of our special education administrators, Amy Sureva, to talk about our school improvement pro program. So over the years, some years we've started with the elementary, some years we've started with the high school. So this year the high school is starting and we'll go back and forth. Um, so I've, I've asked each principal to keep their remarks to five minutes in the interest of time because we do have these presentations <laughs> as, as well as a longer presentation later <laughs> at the beginning of the elementary. I won't tell you it. <laughs> so we'll start with Ms. Miller at the high school. I'll have you start the elementaries. Actually, this is the first time, Dr. Rabb, that the high school's gone first for oh, school boy. improvement plans. <laughs> I just want to note that my pleasure in that. Um, so thank you for having me this evening. It's always a good um, evening when I get to share all the amazing things that we plan to do at Stoughton High School. But before I do that, I just want to extend the invitation to all of you. I know that um, they've already come up, I think, via email, but mo some of you are new, and we have a lot of senior events that are coming up, so I hope you will take advantage of those opportunities to come out and see our students. So on Sunday, um, on June 1st, we have our senior prom, and we'll have a pre-prom event at the high school at around 4.30. 4.30, and um, so you can come out and see all of the kids dressed up. And then on um, Sunday, June 4th at 4 o'clock, we have scholarship night, which is an opportunity for our donors to come and actually hand deliver the um, scholarship checks to our students. And many of those are personal um, donations, so it's a really wonderful evening. And then we have class night on Tuesday at 6.30 and graduation as, uh, on the 6th and graduation on the 8th, which, of course, you sit on the stage, so we will see you then. Um, so please come out and see all the wonderful things that we do. You'll get to see Sarah again as well. Um, so at the high school this year and um, next year, we are still on our NEASC plan. Um, some of you remember that we had our collaborative conference from NEASC in May of last year, and um, it's a two-year process for us to make sure that we've addressed all the things that we need to address before they visit us again in 2024. Originally, they were supposed to come in May of 2024. They have moved that up to March 2024. And when that starts to get closer, we'll be giving you some information about that because they will want to speak um, with some of the school committee, if not all of them. Um, but in line with that, our plan this current year was aligned with the things that we need to work on. And so some of the things you'll see are repeats, but extensions of those things. Um, so this year, we were tasked with trying to p produce our vision of the graduate profile, which are our core competencies, our beliefs about learning, our learning expectations. Um, so our school improvement plan was to develop that. We have a rough draft of the vision of the graduate um, core competencies and learning beliefs. We'll be fine-tuning that language to roll out in the fall for people to have some feedback and input on, and then to develop some rubrics, which will be part of this year's school, plan, school improvement plan. So those two goals um, this past year and this year are very related that. I think it's the first goal in this year's plan where we are taking and extending the vision of the graduate goal to include our learning expectations and rubrics. Um, this year we also have a goal of uh, writing our curriculum all in the same format for all of our courses. Um, we had set the goal to be at 90% of our curriculum by the end of this year. We're really close to that 90%. Um, the final tallies are coming in. Um, but for next year, our second goal in our school improvement plan is to be at 100% of our curriculum by the end, um, actually by February, which is a pretty aggressive, but it, we're, since we're at the almost at the 90% um, at this point, we have about 10% to go. We'll work on the summer over that, as well as in the fall to get that ready for our um, visit, our decennial visit in March. And then the third goal we've been working on this year is uh, around corrective feedback, which was again a NEASC recommendation, which we don't have a consistent method across content areas, across grade levels, um, across the whole school. And so it's a really um, personal conversation for teachers because it, you're starting to get into the hows of, uh, of the, how they do things. But we've started those conversations. We're trying to establish some common threads. Um, we still haven't decided yet how broad those corrective feedback conversations will go in terms of whether it will be a school-wide choice or whether we'll stick to, um, you know, history will will give corrective feedback in the same way and math will give, or whether it will be all algebra one will be the same and all history. So we're still having those um, conversations, but that was one of our goals for this year. And we've had those, we've had those beginnings of those conversations. That goal is again on our school improvement plan for this coming school year um, to really 
firm that up and decide how we will do that and what, again, th these are really important conversations for our teachers. What is the point of feedback? What is the f point of revisions? Should students be able to retake things? How many times they should be able to retake things? How does that impact their grades? These are things that are really important for our, our teachers and our students to be um, working towards. Our last goal on this year's school improvement plan was not on this past school improvement plan, but it is also NEASC related. It's also tied to our social emotional learning. Um, and that is actually listed as goal number three on our school improvement plan this year. Um, this is again a NEASC. It was not on our this year's plan because we did not get our collaborative conference report until October of this past school year. And we weren't certain at the time we did school improvement plans what this particular area, priority priority area would look like. Um, so when we got our report, we knew that this was something that we needed to work on. And so this is in our school improvement plan for 2023-2024, which is about strengthening the lines of communication among all members of the school community for the development, creation, and implementation of social, emotional, and diversity, equity, and inclusion practices in services in the classroom instruction. It's a very broad goal. It's a little bit lofty, but we do need to be able to have these conversations. We need to take a look at all of our programming from academics, extracurricular, um, advisory, all the things that we have, all the, the ways that we um, teach our kids and offer opportunities to our students to make sure that we're including those social emotional um, practices and that we are um, valuing and including all of our students, um, the diversity that we have and ha making sure our practices are equitable. So um, those are how we're doing now and uh, what our school improvement plan will look like next year. Again, very similar to this year's, um, but that's because it's NEASC related, and we have until March to finish those up. Thank you. You're very welcome. Any questions or comments on the high school's school improvement plan? Yes. A couple questions. I wrote a lot of notes as I went <laughs> through this, but I won't ask them all. The <laughs> um, first one may be a little bit um, odd. Okay. But I was wondering what makes the distinction between uh, extracurricular activity and, and athletics. I'm particularly interested in knowing about the color guard, which they seem to win a championship every year, but are just extracurricular activity as opposed to uh, categorized as um, in the athletics. Yes, sure. So athletics, um, we are sp the, the things that fall under our athletic category are also um, in line with our MIAA regulations. And so sports like um, field hockey, hockey, they all fall under MIA. Things like color guard, winter guard do not fall under MIAA, so they're separate. Um, and they tend to be more co-curricular or extracurricular. So there's some curriculum pieces like marching band. Um, they learn some skills within the school day to be able to do those things at oh. in the afternoon. So it's more co-curricular. Mm -hmm. And then marching band, I mean, winter guard and color guard um, are just an extracurricular um, rather than an athletic um, department. Good. No, but they still require physicals and they still require mm -hmm. um, some of those pieces. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, the, other, the other question I have, which I think is important, is that um, in communicating to the community, not necessarily the um, uh, performance of, of the children mm -hmm. or the students, but uh, what do you find as the best way to communicate to the community or the parents? Yeah. That's the million dollar question, I think, uh, Mr. Barbosa. We um, are trying things all the time to try to figure out what is the method that's gonna reach the most parents. Mm -hmm. We use something called Swift K, which is tied to our student information system, which allows us to send emails, like blanket emails. I'm sure you know fam members in the committee have received those before, um, so that we can send emails to a certain grade, certain kids, the whole school, the whole district. Um, so we use that, and we can also use a text message version of that as well, which allows a certain number of characters. Um, I started a newsletter this year as part of my improvement plan as well. I've tried the newsletter route that hasn't reached as many families as we would like to. Um, we use Twitter, we use our um, Facebook, we use Stoughton's, um, Jeffrey Pickett does a great job getting information out on Facebook and our social media pages. Um, what is the exact best way? I'm not sure. I think some form of all of those, we reach uh, a good majority of our, our families. Everyone's using sl something slightly different. Mm -hmm. And as the commun community reaches back to the school, mm -hmm. what's the deal? I've what method it seems to be more effective or most often used? Most often used, definitely email. 
uh, my email is pretty flooded. Mm -hmm. that, is the, <laughs> that is the most popular choice by far. Um, our phones do work. Mm -hmm. We love phone calls. Um, but we get a lot of emails. That's typically the, the way families are communicating back with us. Okay. Um, one more question. Sure. Power school. Uh, everyone uses it, uh, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. But actually, I've had some people in the community ask if we can perhaps leave power school and find a piece of software that's better suited to the cell phone. Uh, I've been told many parents don't have computers anymore because they can do everything on the cell phone. But power school doesn't allow you to get into um, the area where you can see a child's report unless you go out to a website. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been suggested to me that going out to the website can be a complicated and not reliable aspect. So I was wondering if, if you had any thoughts on whether we're married to power school or is the pos are other methods of or other software is being looked at that would be more designed for the phone as opposed to designed from the computer and the phone the second thought. Yes, so that's one decision that doesn't rest on my shoulders, mm -hmm. but um, we do have, you know, our technology department is always looking. Um, the, the reason we use PowerSchool and the reason I think so many school districts use PowerSchool is because it is um, the program that does communicate our data to the, stat, the state um, in a way that is very easy for us to do. The state collects a lot of data from us constantly mm -hmm. um, at, at certain points throughout the school year, and so there's an easy transference of that data with power school. So a lot of school systems use it. Um, I would agree that there are definitely limit, limitations to power school. There are things that I think that could probably be done better. Um, I know that our, our tech department is always looking for things. For example, we just chose a new website platform uh, two years ago, mm -hmm. two years ago, and that was based on the very thing that you're you're asking about is that you know what is a user friendly format on phones. So the website that we went to is um, allows us the phone usage much more easily. It has a that has an actual platform or, or format. I'm, I don't know the mm -hmm. tech terms um, for your actual iPhone so that it, it opens nicely on your phone. So we do keep those things in mind. Um, but power school, it seems to be the choice right now for the district. And I don't know if Dr. Rabb wants to say anything else about that, but. I would, thank you. Yeah. Just, I'd, I'd like to, let me talk to our, our technology department mm -hmm. and find out um, what power school offers in terms of interface on the phone. I know they do have something. It's not the best, mm -hmm. but let me see what they're doing. I know they're always evolving that technology. So let me look into it. And I haven't mm -hmm. involved, investigated it, so. Mm -hmm. uh, one last question. Okay. Am I sounding like Colombo? One last question. <laughs> um, and I'll probably ask this question or everyone can think about it before is that, uh, and I'm new, so let me know if I'm overstepping my boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, what are the three things that you can think of that the school committee can do now that will help you uh, do whatever, you, whatever the role is in, your, your, in the school, in high school? Yeah. As, Talk about being on the hut site. Tough, <laughs> tough night to go first. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think that's a great question. The, f the first thing I think you, you already do, the school committee already does, you support your school system um, wholeheartedly. I, I have always felt supported as an administrator in this district by the school committee and by the community, and I think that's, um, you know, when we see that the town votes for our budget every year, um, even in times when it's been tough, uh, financially, that speaks volumes to the support that you provide to us and the support that the school uh, that the school community provides to us, the trust that we've built over time. So continuing that relationship is hugely important. Um, I think that if, if we can continue moving forward in those directions, then um, any other things that we need um, will come. And yes. that would be my answer for you tonight. Thank you. You're very welcome. Any other questions or comments on the high school school improvement plan? Oh, we have a question. <laughs> Chris. Kathy. Um, first of all, Ms. Miller, thank you so much for tackling the consistency of feedback for students. Um, I think that will help students better understand where they can correct if it's consistent across areas, and that's a very challenging conversation to have with educators. I completely understand how you provide feedback is very personal, mm -hmm. um, and I think teachers would not want to go to more technical in terms of how to do it, like check the box, so. 
Um, so I look forward to seeing where that lands. Um, and at some point, I would love to have a conversation with you about Naviance if we're, if we're opening the tech conversation, <laughs> but I didn't want to do that at this time, just in the interest of time. Perfect. Thank you. So, Mr. Barbosa, just to answer your question, so I feel like a lot of, um, on the student perspective, personally, I opened PowerSchool on my computer for the first time today in about four years. <laughs> um, because I have it on my phone, there is an app um, on like the App Store that you can use. I know my mom has it downloaded on her phone, and I would say the majority of students and parents do have it on their phones if they do have a phone that they can use. Um, but I would say that the like the app is more used than the website would be at this time, like for students and for other families. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Anything else for Ms. Miller? Just right. really quickly, yes. thank you for all your work so far. I think 90% consistent curriculum format is like nothing to, you know, like <laughs> skip over. I think thank that's ex really exciting. And as well as um, Chris's comments about the corrective feedback, I think it's just super important. So I'm excited to see all the focus on these like really impactful areas and what's going to happen in the next year. So Thanks. thank you. I would like to thank you and your team for putting this together because it is a lot of work and I, I look forward to seeing next year your report on how well it's gone. Thank you. All right. Thank you. You're off the hot seat. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Hoffman. Just, just as a reminder, we vote on these at the next meeting. At the next meeting. We're just listening, asking questions, and then at the next meeting we'll have to vote on these. Great. Thank you. Um, Mr. Bon Antonio for his last school improvement plan. Weird. <laughs> mm. But we'll see you a lot more. So. Yes. <laughs> Um, all right, so five minutes. This is a challenge for me, for those of you who have worked with me, so I'm going to do my best. I've tried to take some notes without even flipping the plan over. But I do have to say, this is my last um, school improvement plan um, presentation, and I really, this, this month has been chock full of things that I'll miss as a building principal for the past 12 years. Uh, school council is definitely one of them. School council is an amazing, uh, often overlooked, but wonderful site-based collection of parents, guardians, um, faculty members, community members. Um, you just get a chance to kind of stop once a month and talk about uh, the ways you'd like to improve the school, questions that you have, and people really do come together and they set priorities. So I want to thank this year's school um, council members. I won't read them by name because that might take up my whole five minutes. <laughs> but they are forever um, famous on the school improvement plan there, and I just want to thank all of them. Um, the connection between this year's school improvement plan um, and next year's school improvement plan I think is really a connection of um, social emotional learning, which has been a priority uh, during COVID and since coming out of COVID. Not quite out yet, I would say, at the middle school level, probably everywhere. Um, and then the triennial plan for the district. So I think you'll see echoes of both of those things um, in both years. A very quick recap of this year's plan without even going over each goal. I would say the primary initiative driving this year's school improvement plan was definitely PBIS, uh, a positive behavior um, incentive system is what it used to be called, um, and now it's interventions and supports, but it's the same thing. It's a program that makes clear behavioral and learning expectations for the whole school and then sets out to uh, promote and reinforce positive behavior in lots of ways. So we did this in many, many ways. We're um, in the DESE PBIS Academy. Um, we're getting A pluses at the, uh, at the DESE PBIS Academy. I just want to say at OMS. Um, and we've really gone from like school-wide behavioral expectations, recognizing students with Students of the Month. We do student recognition cards once a week. Students get prizes for those cards and um, we try to kind of catch kids being good and highlight those things. And we're doing um, a possible spirit day, which is kind of like a field day but cooler, um, in June. And each grade level has to kind of earn the spirit day together as a team with incentives for like lunch behavior and attendance, attendance for MCAS, number of student recognition cards and all that stuff. So that's gone really well. I think it's been actually relatively transformative at OMS. Um, and another goal for this year was to get teachers to go beyond their grade level, to kind of mingle and mix and maybe even outside their um, subject area. And I think PBIS has allowed us to do that um, in long Wednesday meetings, which I call Super Wednesday Deluxe. Might be false advertising, but that's what I like to call them. I don't like the word long Wednesday in the contract. makes it sound boring, but anyway. Um, and we tried to add some, um, we tried to increase uh, family engagement as well. And so we added a tech help night for our back to school night. We've added a lot of, a lot of translators. Um, and we've added a lot of staff 
that are bilingual or multilingual, which has been transformative also. Um, and we had one additional parent night this year, but I don't think we added enough. But uh, as you referred to a little earlier, Mr. Barbosa, we're always trying to crack the secret code of what is the best method of um, communication for parents. Mm -hmm. So that's this year's recap. And now quickly going to um, next year's plan. So we decided to focus in three areas. And again, um, continuing with SEL as a priority and then echoing the triennial plan. The student learning goal, we want to focus on this year something called MICAP. I'm not sure if you've heard of MICAP, but it stands for My Career and Academic Plan. It's kind of like an, a thing that's always been around in middle school, but it's kind of been born again and repackaged, and it's, I think it's nice the way that it's been repackaged. Um, it relies on Naviance, Ms. Shannon, so um, it's, uh, it's really a way to get middle schools to actually use Naviance. We've experimented with it, but we don't utilize it too much um, down at the middle school or a platform like Naviance. Um, but my career in academic plan, um, uh, it's the career and college readiness standards for the state. OMS has been um, part of the standard writing group for the Department of Ed um, since its inception a few years ago. And so this year what we, we had a team. Um, they went to the department level trainings, state level trainings, um, and they came back with some ideas and we uh, introduced it to the school council and came up with a goal of having six lessons 100% of our students, all of our students, every grade level, they're going to have six activities that they do um, to start to develop their MICAP profile. Um, and so MICAP is basically when you're a middle school student, because you're only 11, you don't know who you are or what you like. And what you, who you are and what you like on Monday might be different on <laughs> Thursday. You, we all know this at that age. Um, and so my career in academic plan is not about picking a career when you're 11. It's not about that. Uh, it's about discovering what your uh, strengths and weaknesses are, what you are drawn to naturally, what you, what you get excited about or don't get excited about, and then thinking, how could those things maybe relate to some classes that you pick in the next grade or a club that you join? And then ultimately, how could they lead to the electives that you choose in ninth grade and then maybe a college major or a career field? But it's the very beginning stages, appropriately, for middle school. And so we have an advisory period. We call it nighttime. Uh, we do it once a month. And so what we'd like to do is take six uh, MICAP uh, activities, the age-appropriate ones, uh, developed ones for sixth and seventh and eighth grade, and then have students complete them with their advisory teachers in advisory. So that's the student learning goal. The SEL goal, I think Ms. Sareva will speak to a little bit. Um, but the SEL uh, goal uh, this year is our professional development for teachers. So as Triennial Plan sets out a priority for teachers to have very comprehensive, research-based, um, and intense professional development this next year on um, SEL, social emotional learning. So that's our goal for our teachers at OMS as well. Um, and then we added, with the help of Dr. Qualey and the EL teachers in my building and my school council, of course, we added a third goal, which you don't always have, but we added a third goal um, for our English language learners, also echoing um, the triennial plan. Um, we are finding that we have a lot of newcomers at OMS, 38 newcomers this year, um, and they're wonderful. We love our newcomer students. Um, but the expectations for newcomers on making academic progress and, and getting right into English um, language um, competency is a lot. Um, up to that challenge, it's totally fine. I'm not, I'm not saying it's too much, but um, with, uh, we have a lot of newcomers at OMS, 38 this year, I think. Uh, I think we had more, 38 as of April. Um, so it's certainly more. Um, and uh, so we did a goal to try to have all of our students, no matter where they're at, move up a level on their read access testing. So if they're testing at a level one, maybe they can move to a level two the following year. And that was a lot, but I think I did it within close to maybe sort of five minutes. And now I'll take questions. Cat lurks for me. Thank you. Yeah. Um, any questions or comments for Mr. Colantonio? Yes, I'm uh, A couple of questions. Yeah. Um, I noticed Portuguese language is a new one for the school in yes. the curriculum area. Yep. I was wondering how that's going uh, as far as um, uh, the enrollment compared to the other languages, French and Spanish. Yeah, so first year we offered it, this year in seventh grade, uh, and we had about 21 students um, opt to take Portuguese um, in seventh grade, which we think is good. The uh, form went out for sixth graders to choose their language. I don't have those numbers off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. but. Um, we're expecting that um, program to grow. Mm -hmm. yeah. And is, that's going to be available at the high school, I guess. It already is. It already, it already is. is. Yep. We run Good. 10 sections of Portuguese classes at the high school this year. 
Wow. Yeah, that's why we anticipate ours growing. Wow. <laughs> it would be weird if it didn't taste on that. Yeah. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> I have one more question for you. On page eight, on the bo first column on the bottom, uh, create office space for a new EL coordinator at the MS. I was wondering if you have the space to create space. We do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sort of do. We sort of do. Yeah, we have a little <laughs> tiny office for this person who will, yeah, we, got a, we have a space. Okay. We don't have a lot of space, but we have space. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a closet. And of course, what can we do? What's the three most important thing the school committee can do for the next principal of the of the owners? Yeah, I, I would say um, you, you're kind of doing it. So I've been here for 12 years as a building administrator and have never not felt supported um, by the school committee. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like over the last 10 years at OMS specifically, um, we've tried a lot of new things and we've done a lot of um, things uh, and always been supported. Uh, the other thing is just... Um, and the questions that you've asked this evening, um, and I know uh, almost everyone's face from the schools, uh, being in touch with the schools and, um, and, and um, being in communication, um, that's always um, super helpful. Um, so I would say just keep doing what you've always done. Thank you. Thank you. Any other, Fabian? Just a comment. I just want to thank you for your services for the last 12 years. Oh, of course. I know this is your last performance with yes. us. I'll leave <laughs> nonetheless, I'll leave you'll be helping us on the other end, yes. nonetheless. And I, I like the um, plan thus far, and I'm really happy about the MyCap program. I think it's really going to help a lot of the parents and the kids, help them have some self-awareness. So I think that's great. Yeah. Uh, so I will do the Naviance uh, yeah, question sure, to you. Sure. Um, so just out of curiosity, I was wondering why you went with Naviance as opposed to the Massachusetts Career Information System. Yeah. Um, because they do have a middle school and a high school portal for that. Yes. And the documents will actually stay with the students beyond high school, which yeah. I believe is not the case with Naviance. Right. I would say that we, this is not a super impressive answer, Ms. Shannon, but we went, <laughs> we went with Naviance because the high school had it. Yes. <laughs> which, which, is, which is what I figured. And no, no, no. And then we you know, we, we kind of had it already, and right. we weren't using it for a number of years when the high school was using it, so right. we started to use it. But in the MyCap world, at the middle school level, all of the different platforms yeah. are kind of spoken about and yeah. sold. Yeah. I don't mean that in a... No, way, that, but, and, yeah. and my cap is um, at least has... Uh, Naviance is not very robust in the career preparation mm -hmm. area. It's very robust in the college preparation area. Um, and Mass CIS is, is, I find, the opposite. Yeah. So I don't know that one tool is better than the other. They're, they're better for different reasons. Mm -hmm. But I love that you're coupling Naviance with my cap. Yeah. I, I think that's a perfect blend. Um, so I, I really appreciate that. The other... Um, I don't know, comment, question, um, query is, is just MCAS. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's a struggle. I know you're, you're working um, with a student population that's extremely diverse, and I thought it, it was a sign of things to come through the elementary schools, but then when I looked at the elementary school data, it, it seems like this is a bubble mm -hmm. uh, for now. But um, I was just wondering if any of these initiatives are going to speak to Anything that can be done, and, and maybe you're doing that with the English language learners, but but you know to to work on bringing the sixth grade MCAS testing uh, and seventh grade and eighth grade in in line or more in line, closing that gap with the state average. Yeah, I would just say that the school improvement plan is a great document, and it kind of sets here's a couple of like priorities that we're working on. Also, there's like ten other things that we're working on. So yes, and and. For many years, we had as our student learning goal every year, MCAS. MCAT, we would pick something in MCAS. Since COVID, we've gone a little bit more like um, SEL and different student learning goals, but each department has um, an action plan that they do based on last year's data. Mm -hmm. So I'd, I would say the grade six numbers, um, and then wherever we are, really ebbs and flows at the middle school with subjects. And some years we're doing really well in science. Science did uh, pretty well last year. Yeah, science is awesome. Science did really well last yeah. year. Um, and so each department has an action plan that they do that really looks and feels a lot like a school improvement plan, mm -hmm. and it speaks specifically to MCAS on last year's data 
to improve last year's data. So those conversations are definitely happening in departments. I, I figured, I, yeah. I was just curious, yeah. so yeah. thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> Lindsay, anything? Just really quickly, similar to what I said to Ms. Miller, I just really appreciate the work that you all are doing. Um, I think PBIS can be really impactful at the middle school level. Like yeah. you said, students are just figuring out who they are and how they want to show up, and that's just such an effective tool. And I think um, between the MICAP and the social emotional learning, I think there's just a lot going on to be really proud of. So thank you for doing all of that work yeah. for our community. Very welcome. <laughs> Well, I want to thank you as well. There's a lot of work. Thank you to the Student Council and the rest of your team. And I'm excited to see. I think you're leaving the middle school in great hands and exciting to work with you on this side, but I think the middle school's in great shape. So thank you. Thank you. All right. I'll let Thanks you off well. end next. Thank you, Mrs. Weiss. I'd like to invite Amy Sareva to the table. Uh, Amy's one of our special education administrators, and she took on a side job two years ago of working on social emotional learning for the district. And she has really worked hard to implement the first year of our triennial plan with social emotional learning. And she actually did a pre-year before the triennial plan. And then this year, implementing the first year of the triennial plan specifically around social emotional learning. And you've heard that the high school and middle school have a focus. The elementary schools have a common social emotional goal. And so we've made that a district-wide initiative. And I've asked Amy to say a few words just about her work on the triennial plan, setting the stage for that social emotional learning goal, because it's all connected. Great. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> Sorry to have you. Thank you. Um, so two years ago, we did start looking at some of the needs when the kiddos were coming back out of the pandemic and going into school, moving out of the hybrid version, looking at the ESSER funding and what supports we could bring in. At that time, we identified the DESE MTS academies. So every building is participating in academy, whether it's SEL or PBIS. Um, we also brought an additional Bright classroom to the high school. Um, the Bright program, it stands for a Bridge for Resilient Youth in Transition. It's specific for children who are in hospital settings transitioning back to a school setting. It's kind of giving them a soft landing. Um, that's been really successful at the high school. We have two very strong staff members working in it, and it, and it has helped um, a tremendous amount of kiddos. The third thing we brought in, was, or we were looking for, was a way to increase um, therapeutic supports. So at the time, we went with an organization called Gosnold, and they have a school-based model which allowed us to bring additional social workers into the buildings. Um, and it really is supposed to bridge the gap for students who are unable to access therapy after school um, for a variety of reasons. Um, we will be maintaining the model. We will be switching to another. We'll be using the Italian home for children. They also have a school-based model. They're just able to better meet our needs as far as securing enough social workers. Um, and they also have different elements of their program that I really were really excited about. At the elementary level, they give you one unbillable hour for things like lunch bunch or facilitated structured recesses, things like that, that the elementary um, principals can utilize. Um, and they're in each building two to three days a week, depending on the need. Uh, they bill through the student's insurance, and we just pay a yearly stipend for the program, if that makes sense. Um, so that led us to the triennial plan. Once those things were kind of in place, we started recognizing the need to really focus on social-emotional learning. Um, we wrote a plan with 10 action steps for this year um, that we've met all of the steps. So the first one was we surveyed the whole district. Um, as far as the teachers, to really kind of get a better understanding of what they were seeing in the classrooms. Um, and one of the biggest needs people were asking for was an SEL screener. So we utilize Renaissance um, for a lot of our academic assessments. So staying with Renaissance, we've adopted two of their screeners. Um, the preschool has a separate screener, which is why we have two. Um, it's called Pro Ladder. It's through the um, my IGES. There's a lot of acronyms in Renaissance. <laughs> and every time I talk, I'm like, what program is that? And it's the same program. So my IGES will be using Pro Ladder, which is a screener that the teachers will complete on every child. Um, ideally, it should be done three times a year. The first year will likely be done two due to the need for training. Um, the one being utilized K to 12 is called Sabres, um, and it is via FastBridge, again, under the Renaissance. The next thing that we were able to, then we were looking at what, how to utilize the data, what would be the best way. So we have also adopted EduClimber. 
that is essentially a platform that will pull from PowerSchool, will put all of the in-district assessments, such as the STAR 360, um, NSGRA data, and the SEL data, um, as well as from PowerSchool, we also use for our special education programs and for a lot of our discipline. So it'll basically allow us to kind of create um, it's a dashboard for every child. So when the teachers are meeting in their weekly meetings or collaborations, they can really pull up the kiddo and just see all of the information in one place. So that's what EduClimber will allow us to kind of then, year two of the triennial plan will be what to do with the data. Um, the action step number five was kind of talking about the SEL curriculum. One of the areas there is, um, and I don't, know the exact code name, but there's definitely been a little bit of a shift in disciplinary actions and additional steps that are taken prior to any type of suspension. Another level is for districts to kind of identify some restorative practices that they have in place. So we just adopted it and it's really just been rolled out um, within the past month or so. It's Navigate 360 Behavior Intervention Curriculum. So how it's currently, it has a lot of different options, but how we're currently utilizing it is if a student at the secondary level um, receives an infraction for uh, violating the student handbook, we can then utilize this program. So instead of the kiddo having an automatic suspension or sitting in IR ISS, they have to actually complete work relative to the, the infraction. Um, so, for instance, an example would be if a child was vaping and they were found, rather than the child being kept out or excluded from school, they would be completing work specifically <coughs> where they are researching the impact vaping's having on their lungs. That's probably the best example I can give for it. We've just begun using it, so it's really going to take a while before me to be able to say how successful it's been. Um, but so far, it's, it's very well received um, at the secondary level. Um, the other two documents that we created that we will be determining next year the best way to disseminate one is, so six out of the 50 states have in their core curriculum SEL frameworks and standards. Massachusetts is not one of them. Um, so what we did was we surveyed all of the six states. Ohio has a really good one for some random reason, just so you know. New York's wasn't that great, and neither was California's, but Ohio's was awesome. Um, but we did using the CASEL framework. So the CASEL is a social-emotional curriculum. It's like the guru of social-emotional learning. The triennial team participated in a 16-week course on CASEL. And then they were able to utilize some of that information to develop our own frameworks for the state, I mean for the district. So we took the five competencies of CASEL and broke down how that would look through development from preschool all the way to 12th grade. Um, there are things such as responsible decision making, self-awareness, peer connections, those are all encompassed in CASEL. Um, so we did develop a, a preliminary plan. We have shared it out, um, not necessarily with the district, but just with other folks who are overseeing the triennial plan. Um, and, I th and then I think that's everything. I don't think I left anything out. Next year, um, one of our big focuses will be looking at how SEL instruction is delivered in the district. At the elementary level, they do have access, uh, or they do utilize um, second step. Uh, many of the teachers have been trained in responsive classroom and zones of regulation. At the secondary level, that is probably going to be one of our focuses as far as how to give direct instruction. That's one of the really founding components of successful SEL learning. Um, so we're going to be focusing on that. We're also going to be looking at the DCAP, the 504, and the building-based support teams, just the already established protocols we have in place and see what areas we may need to improve upon or maintain or, or no longer follow. I think that's everything. <laughs> that was a lot. I know, Thank it was. You. I'm sorry. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments for Ms. Sereva? <laughs> yeah, that was a lot. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. And it's all new to me. Um, I was wondering if you've thought about, or uh, the schools have thought about measures uh, two or three years from now. Was it effective? Mm -hmm. So in year three, that's when we're going to be reviewing. For, so the triennial plan for the third year is when we're going to be kind of reviewing all of these initiatives. Um, we've purchased most of these things on a one to two year basis mm -hmm. so that it'll allow for that opportunity for us to kind of go back and see the effectiveness or the lack thereof mm -hmm. um, to determine if we want to continue to go forward with okay. them. Uh, the other question of parents. Uh, 
have you had any feedback from parents Not and yet. what are their thoughts? So the SEL screener hasn't rolled out yet. Um, we are that so the other thing we did was design PD for next year. I forgot that part. So five out of the eight um, PD sessions are all going to be on SEL, and they're going to be given to us by the Department of Ed. We've worked really closely with the MTSS academies, um, and one component of that is family participation and family um, involvement. So that's going to be a pretty heavy focus for next year. As a team, we definitely spoke about different challenges um, as well as some potential solutions, but we haven't kind of moved forward with any of those um, initiatives yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, communication to parents? In what regard? In, in be, uh, allowing to be more aware of this program and... So are you speaking feedback? specifically to the SEL screener? So that is something I, we're going to be discussing at the administrative re retreat is how Right now, the majority of students all participate in a variety of assessments. Um, at the elementary level, the results are likely shared in parent conferences and things like that, and the SEL screener would be part of that as well. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as familiarizing the parents with the questions on the screener, that's something that this summer, administratively, we're going to kind of determine the best way to get the information out there. The training for it isn't happening, meaning the teachers being trained in the tool is not happening until October. Um, and then after that is likely when we will be sharing out with the families the tool and the results and what we want to be able to do with the data. Will parents get an opportunity or to opt, opt out? out? That was the million dollar question before I walked in here um, <laughs> by all the principals. Um, honestly, I think that's going to have to come down to a district um, decision that is above me. Um, right now, like I said, it would likely be administered in the same fashion that the other um, curriculum assessments are being administered. Um, it's the actual SEL screener for grades 2 to 12 is about a five to six minute screener that the child takes themselves on a computer. K1 and 2, um, the teachers have to complete it for them and preschool. They No, preschool K and 1, the teachers are completing that screener on the child. Uh, last question. Sure. This may be an uh, odd one. Okay. HIPAA laws? So, I mean, under school, we fall under FERPA, which is the Federal Education Rights and Privacy Act, more so than HIPAA. HIPAA is really something that is utilized by the medical community, and mm -hmm. if you're not a doctor, you don't subscribe to HIPAA. Mm -hmm. um, I absolutely recognize that mental health is um, a touchy subject. Mm -hmm. um, I spend a lot of time telling teachers when I'm trying to drive home the importance of it that if a child is not available to learn, it doesn't matter how, much, how great a teacher you are. Mm -hmm. So we have to really kind of find the ideology that might be behind a kiddo struggling to learn. But specific to FERPA, um, that's really talking more about confidentiality and records. Yes. So as far as opting out of the screener, I think that's a decision that would probably fall on these gentlemen on how they would like to handle that. Mm -hmm. But I recognize that it, it, I, in my own school district, it is an option to opt out of different screeners um, for my own children. So I am aware that that, that can absolutely be um, a possibility. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Any other questions or comments, Lindsay? Okay, <laughs> Chris. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was thrilled to see the layer of SEL across all of the school improvement plans. Um, so obviously you guys are talking to each other and co-planning and, and really doing a concerted effort, um, which will create a continuum um, of approaches, which I love. Um, I was really knocked off my seat when I saw the um, absences at the high school level. Thank you for including that data. Um, and I was going to ask why, but I imagine that that is a layover from the pandemic. Uh, I know re-engagement has been very challenging, and even when students do show up, having them show up on a regular basis is still highly problematic. So one of the things that I was wondering, as you continue to work with the staff around PD, um, if if there are any policy considerations that we should be thinking about uh, as a school committee um, th that would help facilitate the conditions for uh, a more positive SEL environment for our students, um, I'd love to hear that as, 
as um, a byproduct of the work that you're doing maybe you know with within a year or so once once the staff has a chance to sit down and talk about it sure I can tell you for the PDs um, I'm actually pretty excited about them because one of them is called relationship mapping mm. um, where the department the person facilitating it is for instance like you would take a child and you have to identify three or four adults in the school that they feel a connection to um, and then you go forward um, from from no that. one saw that. It's okay. <laughs> um, a couple of the other trainings are implementing SEL in the curriculum and integrating into advisory, which mm -hmm. I think will be really helpful at the secondary level. Mm -hmm. So I'm hopeful upon the completion of PD. You know, the majority of teachers, I don't really think could probably even tell you the the wheel of the castle at this time, just for for lack of of a PD on it. Right. So right. I am hopeful that by the end of next year, SEL is kind of looked through an equal lens. Um, as the other academic areas, mm -hmm. because really it's at the it's at the forefront of the child's success. Mm -hmm. So that is the hope um, as far and, and then hopefully once we're able to establish that, we can kind of move forward with targeting specific areas such as truancy or attendance needs and things of that. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for that. Sure. I'll be any questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. That's really helpful. It's great to know all the details and nitty gritty. And I look forward to hearing next year how things are going. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Mrs. Weiss. So, <laughs> continuing on to the elementary schools, as we've mentioned, each of the elementary schools, the first two goals are common. So, I've asked Mr. Cancellieri to talk about the common uh, first goal for the elementary schools, and then each elementary school has a specific third goal that's specific to the school. So, he'll speak to the DAW. And then I've asked Mr. Dorr to speak to the second common elementary goal, and then he'll speak to his third south goal, and then we'll move, we'll move from there um, through each one. Hey, everybody. And you're still under the five-minute timeline. Yeah, I'm going to move fast. <laughs> I'm going to move fast. Thank God there's so many similarities across our plans. Uh, thank you for having me here tonight. I also want to thank my school council for all the advisory and suggestions and, and brainstorming sessions we had to kind of develop this plan. Um, I first want to call attention to the picture on the front of the plan. Um, this is a big celebration. We met our fundraising goal at our yearly fund run, um, and the reward was roughly 35 to 40 staff members were willing to run through a line of grade level kids and get colored chalk thrown at them. Uh, we had medical goggles on, and uh, it was quite the feat. So this is just a picture of the celebration, something that makes the DAW school really special. So flipping through, two things I just wanted to call attention to that I'm really proud of, specifically for the DAW School, um, is first, how we performed on last year's MCAS assessment, um, our school accountability percentile, and specifically our student group percentiles as well that I included on page six. Um, another thing that I'm really proud of for the school that we rolled out this year for the first time and we're looking to solidify, strengthen, and make better is our building-wide uh, staff to student mentor program that we do, uh, similar to the relationship mapping that Mrs. Sarebo was speaking on. Um, we've noticed a lot of significant changes um, and a lot of benefits to both the staff and the kids after rolling it out for one complete year. It's been really, really neat. But in the essence of time, I'm going to roll into my task of explaining the shared um, goal one. And a lot of the stuff I'm going to speak to is very relatable and similar to what Mrs. Sareva just went over. Um, so goal one, I won't read it verbatim, but essentially it is by May of 2024, all of our elementary school staff will increase their understanding of the current and um, most effective social emotional learning initiatives and therefore benefiting a large, large majority of the students as well. Um, we've had a lot of success with the Zones of Regulation program at the elementary level. If you're not aware of what that is, it's a four color coded program which allows students um, without using verbiage or language to identify what emotions they're currently feeling. So a student in the lunch line at the DAW school that was in a moment of distress or having difficulty um, and just was not in the right place to have a conversation about why could point to a color or name a color and the staff member that was working with the child would be able to identify what emotions that child is feeling um, and then would allow us to make the best next steps. Now we have not perfected our usage of this program so more training will be offered to staff uh, mostly around the area of what are the best next steps based on the reported color that a student is feeling. In addition to that, last year's school improvement plan included four family community events. The first one we did was dedicated to having a night, uh, an informational night for families about what is the zones of regulation. 
what we noticed was oftentimes students were coming in uh, using morning check-ins to check in on how they were feeling when they got to school, how were they feeling before they left for school, and then they got home to mom or dad or whoever is at home with them was having a tough time with their emotions and they would say, mom, I'm, feel I'm in the red zone. And the mom would say, what is the red zone? <laughs> so um, we had an informational night on that uh, in full transparency. It was, the attendance was okay. Um, so I think if we have another night like that, we would have to figure out a different avenue for promotion to bring more people in. Uh, and if we can't, you know, increase the attendance, then somehow make the reproducibles to send home and inform parents in a different way, uh, just so they're aware of what we're utilizing. And then to have a more overt process in educating the kids, not only of the usage of the zones of regulation, but why it's so impactful and beneficial to be able to um, you know, share your emotions and maybe, maybe a way without verbalizing it. So that's something we're going to concentrate on. Uh, Mrs. Sarev also spoke about the Sabres screener. We have found that we have concentrated, especially post-pandemic, teaching the whole child. The academics, of course, is, you know, why we're in school every day, but also the social-emotional aspect of developing the children here in Stoughton. And we found that collecting data would be essential. A student that you've initiated some of these, the zones of regulation, responsive classroom, morning, um, check-ins, we have live morning announcements, they see the counselor, whatever it may be, to not be able to track them from year to year. Are those initiatives having any sort of impact? If they aren't, how do we tweak it and adjust? If they are, we should continue it and allow other students to experience it. So I think the screener is going to be super beneficial for attaching um, a piece of data to the initiatives that we're rolling out. Uh, lastly, like Mr. Colantonio was speaking about, our uh, EL population of students is increasing. Um, and so how do we also make sure s students and their families where English is not their native language are also have access to these social emotional initiatives and uh, therapeutic practices? And we're going to work in tandem with Dr. Queerly in the EL department um, to potentially include more interpreters at events, to have better translations of certain documents and information that we're sending home to families. And also not just, uh, you know, it's not just interpretation, it's not just translation, but also to um, roll out these initiatives in these events in a culturally competent way so people feel welcome, so people feel invited, so people feel safe, so that if, even if English is not their primary language, they know that they can come and learn about practices to best support their children. Um, and that's the third piece of that goal that we're doing as a shared goal across all five elementary schools. So the first goal, that was my task. Uh, Mr. Dorr, I believe, from the South is doing the second goal. And then the third goal at the DAW, so our goals are very, our improvement plans, I'm sorry, are very SEL or social emotional learning heavy. Um, but I wanted to include something academically related so we were held accountable. So the third goal is utilizing our district assessment platform, the STAR 360, that we give three times a year with the option of progress monitoring students um, in between those assessment windows. At the top of the page 10, I included where we are at the most recent winter assessments. We are in the process of rolling out the final assessment of the year that will let me know, let the committee know, and let Dr. Rab know if we've met that 70% uh, rating of proficiency. Um, this new testing um, platform, the STAR 360, and the access that we have to the data side of things as a building administrator actually allows us to identify not only proficiency pr percentages, but also student growth percentages. So I made sure to attach a 70% goal to not only proficiency ratings, but also how are the students com uh, growing in comparison to their peers that scored at a relatable level. So 70%, um, and we're there almost in many of the different areas. I broke it down by reading, um, early literacy, and mathematics. And to get to that 70%, this year we rolled out formal data meetings that include curriculum, um, district curriculum. People come down to our buildings to join these meetings. Interventionists, grade level teachers, so we do that four to six times a year. Um, we have PLC meetings. We focus our attention on specific things during our observations of teachers and walkthroughs, progress meetings. We work with Mrs. Montebald that develops after school and before school programming uh, to target interventions for particular kids based on the data that we pull from these reports. So I wanted to make sure to include something that was related to the academic side of proficiency uh, to be held accountable when we come back here next year and review these plans. I think I kept it under <laughs> five Great. minutes. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. All right. Any questions or comments on the DAW school improvement plan? Well, no. <laughs>
Uh, a couple of questions. Uh, of course. One of the things I was curious about, you have a pre-K and K, mm -hmm. and you probably, you, I don't think you'll probably have this data on the top of your head, but I was wondering um, if there's a noticeable difference between the kids come, that come from pre-K program to the kindergarten as opposed to kids that don't uh, participate in the pre-K um, program before coming to the kindergarten. So I don't have the data in front of me. I can say next year uh, it will be my seventh year being the principal at the DAW school, which is crazy to say. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think if you, you know, surveyed any kindergarten teachers, there is a noticeable difference from students that are attending, um, you know, full preschool in students that do not. Mm -hmm. Not even for um, do they have letter and number recognition and color recognition, but things that we're now noticing post-pandemic, can they sit in a chair? Can they stand in a line? Can they wait their turn? Um, some of the uh, OT-related stuff, can they hold a pencil the right way? What is their scissor grip like? So some of the non, I'll say, core subject area skills, um, but more of the social skills, that if they're not in line with many times what a full-scale preschool would give to a child prior to entering to kindergarten, we now have to teach those things before we can even access core subject areas. Mm -hmm. So I would say yes, without the data to support it, I think my colleagues would agree with me um, mm -hmm. that you know attending a preschool prior to the transition to kindergarten has a tremendous, tremendous positive impact on behavior in SEL, which therefore allows them to access the core academics quicker mm -hmm. and more effectively. So I, I would say probably everyone here would agree pre-K is very good. A very, yeah, very important. Okay, thank you. Um, one more question. On page eight, um, in an effort to ensure that at least 90% of students are supported, um, I, I guess my, my question is why 90%? Is there additional support that the DAS school needs to uh, make a goal of 100%? I think at the time, in full transparency, uh, we were unsure exactly of what the SEL assessment tool would look like. Mm -hmm. So we were unsure if it was going to be through um, observations, if the students would be filling out questionnaires on their own, um, and even how often that assessment was given. And we felt as though, uh, and my colleagues can correct me if I'm wrong, if 100% would have been too lofty without knowing the exact assessment tool. Mm -hmm. um, I'm confident now, <laughs> uh, having worked with Mrs. Soreva, that our, it, all the DAW school students, 100%, will receive the appropriate SEL tools, strategies uh, to be successful in school. Mm -hmm. And um, I think you mentioned that uh, the English learners would, um, might be, I thought maybe the English learners would, that ten, would be that 10% that might be more difficult to reach with the language barriers. We, and we didn't know at the time, and I'm, not, I'm sure we still have many questions in, in the area of the screener, you know, language proficiency and the ability to access a screener, um, potentially a student on uh, individual education plan, does that impact their accessibility of the screener? Um, so I think there were just questions that when we were developing the plan, again, um, there were too many questions to give it the stamp of 100%. We know with what our skill set, 100% of the staff will get it, um, but not knowing what the actual screener was going to look like. Thank you. Make promises. Thank you. Thank you. Chris, again. Still love you. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you I so much. That. Next. I'd like to invite Mr. Dorr to do the second. We're going to go out of order just a little bit okay. to keep it consistent. Mr. Dorr will do the second common goal for the elementary schools and then his third South School goal. Good evening. Well, thank you for having me. Um, similar to my colleagues, I'd like to thank my school council for their collaboration this year. A lot of conversations about what I think if we could do it, we probably would have 10 or 12 goals on our, our plan every year. And truthfully, we probably do have 10 or 12 goals. Just three are you know, in this actual document itself. Um, so just to highlight a couple of things at the South to start us off, and then I'll get into uh, goal number two. Um, this is my second year at the South School. This is our second year doing, I brought with me, I've been trained in PBIS, so we started a PBIS model last year. It's um, mid-revisions in year two. Um, we fully feel like the whole community is on board. I think more than just focusing on the behavior element, it creates a community. Um, 
which we've really dove deep into what it means to be a shark and attend the South School and, and how you can promote being a shark. And shark is safe, hardworking, accountable, respectful, and kind. As you can see on the second page, we have the uh, matrix that the um, uh, staff at the um, South School developed. Um, and it's really caught on. So the, you know, if you walk by my school in the front office, you'll see these um, grade level buckets filled with pom poms. So that's every student who has exemplified being a shark in some way or another received a ticket that cashed in for a pom pom. And then when your bucket's filled, you get a prize for your grade level. So um, you contribute to that whole piece. And that's really brought our culture along for both students and faculty. And, and you just hear a lot of like, oh man, like I, you were being really kind right there and how, how you're identifying those pieces, which has been amazing. Um, I think in developing a lot of these goals, we talked a lot as a team of principals about like what was really important. And as important as academics were coming out of COVID and over the past two years, the thing that's really bubbled to the surface has been social emotional learning and our kids available to make those academic achievements and what can we do to promote that. So in uh, goal number two, what you'll see is by May of 2024, 100% of the students will have participated in social emotional learning activities and relationship building practices, thus reducing the number of BBST, which is building based support team referrals for social emotional reasons. Um, so um, I think the biggest piece is really pushing this idea of social emotional learning and it being a, having a place in the school day. So if you look through the action steps, it identifies, and for each building, this is gonna look a little bit differently, depending on the teachers, depending on the supports, but really it's finding a time for morning check-ins and those procedures throughout the day. How are you checking in with students? What routines can you put in place that are consistent? Having a wide menu of options for different types of teachers to choose different types of things. It doesn't have to be consistent with the Wilkins and the Daw and the South, but the time needs to be consistent. Um, you know, finding times for social emotional learning activities apart from just your school counselor coming in and doing second step, what are you doing as the classroom teacher? Are you doing, you know, a learning activity? Are you doing some type of journaling? Are you doing some type of circle sharing? Different ways to promote that social emotional learning. Um, and then as part of, part of this is, is really getting that tier one support so that we're able to really surround students with those social emotional supports on the day to day so that we are addressing some of these, some of these like low hanging needs that we can address as a whole school um, and then cut down on these referrals for, you know, this student is not able to really attend every day in math or they're having these, you know, they're requiring a, a substantial amount of support from multiple staff members during the day. What, is, what are their needs? How are we supporting them? And, and cutting down on these referrals to go through this formal process and seeing if these supports can be put in place for all students, and that will cut down on that ref referral process for social emotional support. So really, that's the goal. Um, every school does it slightly different, differently. Um, you know, Mr. Cancellari was talking about the um, his mentoring program, the South School is bringing back Sharks and Minnows, which was a mentoring program for the entire school where the whole school kind of shuts down and does um, like a session with all the kids and it's cross grade level with different teacher supports. Uh, each of the schools has something different that they do. Um, but in, in general, it was prioritizing and then having the opportunity for us as a team to be able to come together as principals and see what things are working best, what practices can be transferable from school to school and you know what works alongside our triennial plan that Mr. Sareva talked about as well. Um, so that's the biggest thing for goal number two. Uh, my third goal is, it's so weird, it's very similar to Mr. Cancellari's because we, we talked about it. Um, we do want to prioritize academics. Um, mine similarly hits that 70% um, of students uh, will be proficient as defined by the STAR 360 assessment. Uh, that was something really important to my school council and myself um, was still maintaining a lot of these resources that the district and the school has poured into academics and making sure that that's in the forefront of something we're continuing to talk about at school council, something that we're talking about as a school, something that we're monitoring, the data that comes with that information and being able to use the interventionists that have been added to the school's um, staff, the additional uh, specialists that have been added to really dive into, hey, in third grade, we're really going to need a little bit more support in literacy for this upcoming unit. Who's going to be doing that? Does the data support it? And then being able to really 
move forward with that support um, and be able to hold ourselves accountable. The one thing that we did talk about that was added this year was it's not just proficiency, it's also the student growth percentile, which I think is a really important thing to be looking at because we could be getting to 70% of the student growth percentile but not quite at proficiency. And I still think it's something that for my staff, we want to be able to celebrate because if you're getting the student growth percentile, in some ways to me, that's even more important than proficiency overall because you're saying that all of those students are getting to that thre uh, threshold every year. So that's what I got. I definitely stayed under five. <laughs> Thank you. All right, any questions for Mr. Dwyer? Armando. <laughs> yes, on uh, page six, parent involvement, I see there's a mention of uh, caregivers not having access to the internet, and um, I was, I'm kind of concerned because we're all going email and internet and power school and everything else. So I was wondering if uh, the other school principals um, are also concerned that we're going in that direction and we still have parents without internet access and uh, I'm wondering if anyone has on top of their head know what percentage of the student population's parents or caregivers don't have internet access. I don't have that percentage. I think I included that as more and I think we've talked about it. It's, it's just do they have access to it? Are they using it? Is there other ways that we can go about supporting this communication? I mean, we have a lot, and I think everyone at this point has talked a lot about the different ways that we communicate with families and finding, I think the word was like secret sauce that was used by someone, that, that maybe Mr. Colantonio, it sounds like a Mr. Colantonio phrase. Um, but like, just a way really to like, what's working? Is it paper-based? Is it the community backpack? Is it, you know, the text alerts? Is it emails? And honestly, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I think it's just really always keeping in mind how we're blasting out information and what is important, because mm -hmm. truthfully, everything is important it's, if it's coming from us, and we want everyone to have that information. That's mm -hmm. why we send it out in the first place mm -hmm. and continue to just revisit that. Um, probably not for you, but for everyone here, any effort at all to try to determine what's the really the best way to communicate with parents? Any studies or uh, ad hoc uh, survey of parents indicate how would they like to be communicated? We're, we're at an age where, in my opinion, uh, going out for information, uh, people are not doing with the day of streaming and everything else. Parents are also starting to expect the data to come to them and as magical or the secret sauce to just appear in their phone. Um, and I understand parents have to have that, that drive to go the extra step also, but uh, I think it's probably the school system's um, priority to make sure that we take that super extra step to get to them. Um, and I was wondering if anyone had any thoughts or ideas about uh, um, how do we take that extra step or how can the school committee help? I was going to say, one of, the, one of the ways that the teachers communicate with the parents on almost a daily basis is through what we call the Remind app. And at the elementary level, that's crucial in delivering information to the families. It's on their phone. It pops up like a text message. And that is probably the first line of defense, so to speak, for communicating with families. And it's used probably more than any other means of communication that we have. Um, and I also do feel that we put a lot of effort into communicating every Friday with our community. And we do, we do have the, the information of how many families are ex accessing the emails and have that time's up <laughs> <laughs> and and have the ability like you were asking about the internet the, who, who has internet access and who doesn't we do have that we have to report that every year um, I don't believe that it's a very large percentage right now I know in my building every single parent has email access so but that remind application is probably the number one way that we communicate <laughs> and parents are on it with their teachers all the time so I'm not sure if that answers your question but it does uh, unfortunately for one reason or another, the Remind app did not work on my phone. <laughs> well, one of the things we did this year was to make sure that everybody was using the Remind app and not using, there was a couple of Class Dojo, a couple other options, mm -hmm. is to have everybody use the Remind app consistently so that people didn't have to download six different apps and have to figure out which one worked. Mm -hmm. so. Very good. Any other questions, comments, or 
One point of clarification. Um, goal three on page 11, am I safe to assume that you mean by May of 2024 or have you already completed this goal? Oh, uh, that would be 2024. Okay. <laughs> That's why you're not voting until next week, so. Just double checking. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? All right, thank you, Mr. Doerr. Thank you for all of your work on this. I'd like to invite Mr. Julia to talk about the specific goal for the Gibbons. You get five minutes to get to rave about the Gibbons, right? <laughs> My favorite comments is brevity is beautiful. Uh, I'm Dave Goulia, the proud principal of the Gibbons Elementary School. Good evening, everyone. I do want to thank my school council members, uh, Ken Kalin, uh, who's soon to retire, uh, Jackie Doucette, Mark Strzok, Allison Cook, Lauren Spiegel, Christina Kamara, Melissa Crowley, Ian Quinn, and Angela Palmer, one of our health and PE teachers. Um, on the cover is a, a drone picture of our school um, with links of a chain um, linked. So this came from one of our third grade teachers. It was an idea she had over the summer um, that each student would have a chain, a piece of the chain, and then we would all link them. Um, and we had a beautiful fall day. And um, one of our teacher's husbands, Evan Walsh, took the drone photos. So uh, if you're wondering. And then we took a student from each class and made a, a circle in the middle inner circle. Um, as you know, um, we have common goals for the first two, for our school improvement plans. Um, school improvement planning is a, a priority of the school council. A lot of my school council members sit on my PTA as well. Um, a lot of our discussions are around our high needs population at the Gibbons. Our high needs population um, has grown at the Gibbons. Um, and every school uh, across the district has grown um, profoundly. So now close to 60% of the Gibbons school students are deemed as high needs. A lot of our conversations um, turn to how can we best support our students. Right now the district does a great job supporting our students from the moment they walk in. We provide them with breakfast, lunch, after school programs, vacation programs, summer programs. We do a lot, but we need to do more. Um, and this is where, uh, this is an opportunity to engage my school counselor and my PTA that wants to do more to help these families. Um, we're certainly thinking about our EL families and our um, EL PAC with, with Dr. Qualey and how we can meet the needs of our EL population in the Gibbons district. Portuguese is the language that you're going to hear in the hallway, if not English. It's 90% of the EL students at the Gibbons school. Um, speak Portuguese. I know it's different, different parts of the community. Um, we're planning to offer Portuguese as one of our after school programs to teach our students Portuguese and their principal a little bit more Portuguese. Um, but when we're talking about basic needs, um, the question becomes what do our families need? And this is what we've learned when we engage our families in conversation. They need school supplies, they need backpacks, they need um, coats jackets, gloves, all of these things. Um, Mr. Barbosa asked about internet access, which I thought was a great question. Um, with the pandemic, this was certainly on our minds because we distributed Chromebooks to every family and everyone was learning virtually. And we know that experience wasn't the same for all of our students. Um, we do have these, they look like hockey pucks, where if a family is, doesn't have internet, um, we can set that up for them. We can help set that up for them because it's so important. So much happens on these Chromebooks um, and with technology. Um, so our goal is really um, connected to supporting our families, thinking about how we can meet their needs because we know if we can meet those basic needs, it's going to impact our STAR data. It's going to impact MCAS data. It's all connected. Um, so that's what the Gibbons is going to um, focus in on as our community engagement, our third goal. We certainly look closely at MCAS data, our STAR data. We have that same goal, 70% of students um, at or above proficiency. And we're completing our end of the year assessments um, as we speak. But that data at the Gibbons looks very promising right now. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have about the Gibbons school. Um, Thank you. Any questions, Armand? <laughs> yes, on um, page nine. I, I found it interesting that um, on the first block, um, PTA can be utilized to assist these families. And I was wondering if you could give me, you just mentioned the puck. 
other areas in which the school can help the families and, of course, get to the students that way. Yeah, so it starts with communication, I think, and this is coming up a lot in the meeting today as I've been listening to the comments and questions. So it starts with families, parents feeling comfortable to communicate to the school. And oftentimes it's some, it can be through a, a parent connected, maybe not to the principal or a teacher, but if those lines of communication are open, and hopefully people at the Gibbons know where to find me, I'm outside every morning and afternoon, um, it starts there with communicating their need. Um, and then we have to be very respectful of their dignity um, and keep that information confidential. That goes through myself and our, our counselors. Um, but if once that communication is there and we have a better understanding if they're having problems with internet access, we also have, um, there are students that sometimes, there are families that need help um, linking to a pediatrician. Mm -hmm. um, there's all an array of different questions that we're fielding each day, wow. but they have to feel comfortable first. So something the district has placed a uh, priority on are language capabilities of new staff members coming in. So um, it's, a, it's a comprehensive effort. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Chris? Of course. Um, so I was thrilled to see the school-specific goal of the four community engagement um, events. I think that's a really brilliant way of engaging with the community in a meaningful way and modeling for students what it means to be a strong civic leader, in a sense. Um, so it's, I, there's, there's so much great coming from that. Um, I was wondering, in terms of trying to provide supports to your EL parents, um, if you've thought about partnering with your ABE services, like the ones that are available in Brockton, to have them come in or to provide a workshop, um, that's their area of specialty. That sounds like a wonderful idea. I'd be happy to learn more. Yeah. I know that um, Brockton, um, there was just an article I was reading in the paper about all the services that Brockton has, their EL um, parents. That sounds like a wonderful program. And knowing Dr. Qualey and the work that she does with the EL Parent Advisory Council, that's great. I know that parents would be interested in that. Yeah, yeah. I can connect with you on that. Absolutely. Sure. Oh, yeah. uh, I'm really excited by this. I know the PTA has done a lot of, in the school to do things like um, provide basic toiletries and the bathrooms, and I know that that's been they've they've seen a lot of use for that. They're constantly asking for that, and it's a very subtle, but it's such a small thing. Um, my sister's a music teacher in a completely different state, but she can, she notices a difference when students come in and they don't have access to food, they don't have access to clothing, to basic toiletries, she, she can't teach them music. Um, so I think it, it is really important to um, attend to this needs, and it's, it's very eye-opening to see how much need there is in the community. I think it's, it's kind of sad that we have to do it, but I think because we have this position of trust and that we are, are in a position to do a lot of good and help these students. So I'm excited to see how this works out. It's a very exciting goal. All right, thank you. Any other questions? All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gulia. And now I'd like to in invite Ms. Monahan up to talk about the school specific goal for the Wilkins. And Mrs. Feeney couldn't make it this evening, and so Mrs. Monahan has agreed to step in and talk about the school specific goal for the Hansen as well. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm going to start with the Hansen's um, school improvement plan. And because she's not here, Mrs. Feeney's not here, I am going to try to summarize it as best I can, and then I'm just going to read the goal straight from her report. So I think that will probably be the, the best way to handle it. And certainly, if you have any questions about her plan, I think I can try to answer them, as can any of my colleagues, after I'm done talking about this a little bit. So from reading through her school improvement plan, improvement plan, it seems to me that a big focus for the Hanson School is helping the students with their accountability. And all educators really work towards this with the students. And part of that is helping the students recognize their own strengths and their own areas of growth academically. And once those students are able to kind of identify the things that they feel really confident in and the things that they feel that they could still work on, they're able to come up with a goal and then put in steps to achieve that goal, and therefore they were also then becoming accountable for their success. So her whole third goal is all about that. So I'll just read it for everyone here. So it says, by the spring of 2024, 100% of our students in grades four and five will identify one strength and one obstacle to their learning. 
Each student will set a goal and create action steps to improve in the area they feel is an obstacle to show accountability and ownership of their learning. Students and staff will monitor this goal throughout the spring and complete a final reflection on progress to share prior to the start of the 2024 MCAS season. So I think this is a really solid third goal for their school and I, I have every confidence that they'll do a great job with it. Um, I don't know if you have any questions for the Hansons plan, but <laughs> I'm sure we can all chip in. And uh, uh, page one, I was just wondering how, how that school is done for space. S I'm sorry, what? Space. How her school is in terms a, of space. Yeah, there's I mean, a typo here. It says 2,865 students, which I know the Hanson doesn't <laughs> have that many. Okay. Because <laughs> 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 I would say we be out of space for that. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. So now I'll go. Now I'll get into I, I just wanted to oh, add, sure. a, add a comment. I think this is really a really great goal, and I would love to see how it feeds into the middle school because I think it's yeah. you know, as we yeah. as the kids go towards middle school um, identifying your own goals in terms of you know elementary school I think will translate into the middle school program which will then translate into the high school so I'm excited to see how this works after a few years yeah. and these students moving through and I love the idea of, of norming around picking a strength and picking a weakness for everyone so no one feels singled out mm -hmm. and they are taking accountability for themselves and learning it's such an important step toward maturity yes okay all right on to the wilkins so um a few things that we're really proud of at the wilkins is we've spent a lot of time and focus this year on fostering and building the relationships that not only that the staff have with the students but that the students have with each other and that feeds right into the SEL goals that we had last year and then we'll continue to have coming up. We also have morning check-ins that the students complete every single morning on either their iPad or the computer and teachers are able to gauge how the students feel coming in, in during the day. That was kind of a precursor before we knew if we were going to have a universal screener for SEL needs that we tried and implemented this year within our own school. We found a lot of success with that and it's helped teachers have those conversations not only with the students but with the families based on how those students are reporting that they feel every day. Um, we're obviously very happy with our academic success this year and we have a lot of different things in place to continue on that same trajectory and that kind of brings me to the goal that we have for our third goal. Last year our goal was to be 70% at or above benchmark on the STAR 360 data for the students in our school and as of our winter benchmark data we were there for both our reading and our math. We weren't quite there yet for early literacy but we're hopeful that for the spring we will be able to be close to if not at that 70% for the early literacy so that's really exciting and so we thought taking that one step farther for next year our goal is to focus more not so much on the different intervention services that we have in place but more on that solid tier one instruction so that we have less students needing that intervention and so this goal is all about reducing the amount of students that actually even require that extra support so for next year it's a little bit of a lofty goal, but I'm fairly confident we'll be able to attain it, that we'll have 10% or less of our students requiring those intervention services in grades two through five, and those are what we'd call tier two intervention services. So this isn't special education, this is general education intervention supports that students might need based on where they are. So that's our third goal. Thank you. Questions? Come on. This is amazing. Oh, thank you. Really amazing. Huh. It's the teachers, so. Yeah. You found the secret sauce. <laughs> <laughs> Trying. <laughs> I was wondering if you could tell us more about um, this program or this result. And so I think I think a lot of it comes down to the work that we do analyzing the data that we have on the students and we do that all of us do that on a very regular basis and I think it's always being ready and willing to talk about different ways to reach each, each of the kids and I think that that's really important that differentiation and looking at each student as an individual who has different needs and therefore needs to have a different approach to instruction we spent a lot of time all of us have in trying to figure out the different intervention supports that would be best for the students especially coming out of the pandemic who perhaps had gaps in their learning and we've spent a great deal of time trying to figure out the best way to build back up some of that lack of foundation that they had 
Um, but I do, it's a testament to the teachers. I think they spend countless hours thinking about the students and the best way to support them. And, you know, their dedication certainly has paid off. Mm -hmm. Is there enough sauce to go around? I, I think I think it. I think you'll be very impressed with how all the schools are are doing. When our spring data comes out, mm -hmm. we can see each other's, and it's very impressive. I think that we've all worked really hard. So, yes, it's definitely everyone has a sauce. <laughs> <laughs> very good. <laughs> Lindsay, no, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, just a quick question for a point of clarification. With the, the third learning goal that you have with the Tier 2 interventions um, being no more than 10%, I was just wondering, where are you now? Right now, we're, we're higher than that. I mean, uh, we're still trying to remediate and, and support students because they're not quite where they should be in terms of that benchmark. And they're needing that smaller group instruction in order to be as successful as they are. And that's why that coaching model that I speak to in my goal is so ultimately important. We are so fortunate to have two literacy specialists, and I have two math specialists in my building, and their primary goal and role in our building next year will be to be pushing into the classrooms and supporting those teachers and helping those teachers reflect on their instruction and improving their instruction so that they're able to address the needs in the classroom rather than having to pull the students out in a small group. Um, so I, I feel very confident that we'll be able to reach that, but it will take, you know, it'll take a lot of work, so. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Oh, yeah. I just want to congratulate you guys on the commendable work that you guys are doing and basically identifying that component for the child that's needed. I think us as individuals, we all have a different way of learning. And for you guys to be able to focus on that and actually implement something that works and helps the kids, congrats. <laughs> all right, thank you. Thank you for presenting the Hanson and for the Wilkins. And thank you, thank, thank you. you all for your work and for coming and presenting. I, this is one of my favorite parts because it's so exciting, it's energizing. I feel like we're doing something <laughs> and productive and I look forward to seeing the kids' success. So good luck to all of you as you implement you. this. So will we discuss this vote on this next week? Yes. Okay. If I could make a suggestion, Mrs. Weiss, in the interest of the project management team, if we could do the donations while they set up their presentation. Sure. And then they can do their presentation and then we'll go back to the agenda okay. after that. All right, great. Um, so the next item would be the donation to the Thank class you all. of 2023. Thank you. Um, Dr. Rob, I'll hand it to you. Sure, thank you. So parents and guardians of the class of 2023 have completed an outside fundraising event for the class of 2023 and provided donation as a result of that fundraising event in the amount of $9,700. The desire is that the class be able to use this donation for class events like the senior prom scheduled for June 1st, 2023. I respectfully request the donation be considered for school committee approval. All right, thank you. Um, can I have a motion to approve the donation to the class of 2023? So moved. All right. Thank you, Armando. A second? second? All right, the motion has been moved and second. Thank you, Fabian. Any questions about this donation? Any comments or discussion? Well done, Deb. <laughs> yes, yeah, I was going to say, yeah, like, this is fantastic, great news. Wow. Um, I'm sure that this is well needed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, well, seeing none, let's move on to a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Weiss, members of the committee. Yes, thank you to the parents. All right, the next one is the donation to the SPS drama program. Thank you. Mr. Stephen Prone, a local citizen, after seeing the Adams family spectacular music at Stoughton High School, presented a donation of $1,000 to the Stoughton High School drama program. The funds are to be used to support the Stoughton High School drama program. I respectfully request this donation be considered for school committee approval. All right. Can I have a motion to approve the donation to the drama program? All right. Thank you, Chris. Is there a second? Second. All right. I'm on a second from Rondo. Um, any questions about this? Any comments or discussion? Oh, just a thank you. <laughs> I you know you like the musical a little bit, Rondo. Oh, How many times great. did you see it? Loved it. it. I, I saw it twice. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I also want to say I, this is wonderful. I. I think this drama program is great. I can't believe it's only been here for a few years. How long has it been? Yeah, two years. Two years. Two years. Yeah. This is incredible, yeah. the amount that they're able to do. Um, one of the things I really love is the inclusiveness of this program, um, that 
you know, it, it, they put on such a fantastic program in which the stars shine, but so many other people can participate. I remember my own drama program in high school. If you didn't compliment the two stars in the school, you didn't get in. And so I never appeared on a drama program on the drama stage because I was too tall. I overshadowed the two stars. So I think this is fantastic. I'm really excited to see the community support of our program. So I recommend voting. Um, if there's no other comments or discussion, let's move to a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, the motion has passed. Thank you very much. And the next <laughs> item is the budget transfers approval for FY23. Dr. Rob? Sure. So you have in your packet a transfer request for FY23, and we're requesting to transfer $1,036,926 from the instruction category to the other school services category primarily to cover the deficit as we've talked about in special education transportation. And so we've talked about in the past that we have had additional riders and this year, and we've had additional expenses. And through a combination of, and we talked about we haven't filled the paraprofessional positions in first and second grade, as well as unfilled positions, retirements, maternities, we've been able to uh, save a little bit of money in the instruction category and move that over into the 3,000s. And so I would respectfully request an approval to make those transfers. All right, thank you. Can I have a motion to approve the, but the FY23 budget transfers? All right, thank you, Chris. A second? Second. All right, thank you, Armando. The motion has been moved and seconded. Any questions about this transfer request? Any comments, discussion? All right, let's move to a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> and the motion has been uh, carried, 5-0. Thank you right. very much. <laughs> thank you. Um, right before we get to the, um, should we do the minutes? The minutes is the next item on the? Sure, I, it, okay. it, we can, sure. They're set up, so I just want to give them time to do Okay, this. all right. Um, any, the next item is the minutes for April 11th, 2023. Does anyone have any amendments or corrections to the April 11th minutes? Are we ready for a vote? All right. Uh, can I have a motion to approve the April 11th regular meeting minutes of the Student School Committee? So moved. All right, thank you, Lindsay. A second? Second. All right, <laughs> thank you, Fabian. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Abstain. Aye. All right, thank you. That motion carries 4 0 with one abstention. And um, last is the April 25th minutes from the regular school committee meeting. Um, anybody have any? corrections or amendments to the April 25th minutes. I do. Chris. <laughs> on, my microphone. on page five, uh, it says Ms. Chris Shannon suggested partnering with organizations like Kitty Academy at the very top of the page uh, to have activities for kids to see if they, and I wanted to um, strike the last of that sentence and add instead, would host a community information forum in partnership with the building committee. All right. Any other corrections or amendments? I'll let Nicole. Okay. <laughs> You're good. Okay. You got that. I've got it written here. Oh, okay. right. Should we table these for to vote on later, Nicole? Or do, you, do we need to table these to vote on next time or postpone them until no, next time? Okay. They just do as, amended. as amended. Okay. Can I have a motion to approve the regular meeting minutes of the Stoughton School Committee from April 25th, 2023, as amended? So moved. All right. Thank you, Chris. A second? Second. Thank you, Lindsay. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. The motion, the minutes are accepted, five nothing. And now moving on to, we have the, uh, the FY24 budget and articles. <laughs> very simply, we finished town meeting and the budget passed and our articles passed as well. So we're very excited about yes. that. Yes. <laughs> Celebration. <laughs> um, I would like to thank Sam Lafarge for coming to speak um, on behalf of the Handsome Playground and Morgan Gropey for their 
for her comments as well, and to the Hanson Hawks for their support. Um, that was fantastic to see all of them there. And I look forward with Mr. Quigley to going down the slide when it's all built. <laughs> so um, moving on to you, the, new, the elementary school building project. So uh, Dr. Rob, if you'd like to. I do a very quick introduction. We're joined by Mr. Tim Bonfatti and Carl Franceschi, the project management team, along with Chin Lin and Courtney Southwick, who have been very involved in the project, uh, to bring us uh, looking really forward to the next step. So this is a little different than the last presentation. We're looking to the next steps, um, what's involved with the project in the next couple of months. Thank you. And whenever you're ready. Before we go to the schedule, we just want to call your attention to the June 1st community meeting. It's just another forum to get the word out to folks who, yourselves and people who are watching, um, that there'll be another opportunity to, um, uh, for the community to hear what's happening and to give feedback. And just this is to remind you, remind you the schedule. We talked about this a lot the last time we were here. Um, you know, the, after we had our meeting, when we came in front of you the last time, the building committee did elect to um, extend the date for submission of the PSR to uh, August. So that's what the plan is now. So um, as you can see, the building committee is going to be dealing with the, the decision around the preferred design option. But the school committee needs to deal with the decision on the on the um, consolidation and redistricting um, uh, issue. So that's what we're here tonight is to begin that. We have another meeting scheduled for you for, I think, June 13th. I think that's still on the calendar. Um, and we'll be looking probably for a meeting in, in some point in July just to sort of wrap it up. You take your final vote on that, and, and that'll form the basis with the building committee's decision on the option of how um, what we submit to the MSBA. So this doesn't, um, as you can see on this slide, this doesn't affect the ultimate time and deadlines that we had set originally, which is to have a town meeting and a, uh, a debt exclusion vote in the uh, next town meeting, in the uh, next spring's annual town meeting, and then have the, the ballot initiative scheduled sometime right around that. We're now targeting uh, the Mass School Building Authority board meeting for, pro it, it's not been determined yet, but probably April of 2024. So um, we are still on schedule, even with that little blip in the, in the um, submission deadline uh, and extension of the submission deadline. So um, with that, we can commence. So today we're going to talk, I think we talked about the kinds of issues we'd bring in front of you the last time we were here. Well, today we're going to start to delve into them in a little more detail. So we want to share with you some of the, the factors that we hope you'll consider in thinking about redistricting. The question there is, you know, should Stoughton consider basically going from five elementary schools to four? Some of the factors that, that our team has identified and, and other communities, frankly, have identified too, are, are listed there. It, it's a way to maximize state reimbursement, if you think about it. Um, in other words, uh, the, the state, the school building authority is a partner in this. Um, they they um, commit a grant of a significant amount of money. It, the exact percentage isn't exact worked out, but it's you know approximately half the cost, uh, you might say, is coming from the state. Um, and it is all of our monies that went into the sales tax. That's how the MSBA is funded. Um, but having a larger project, the consolidated project, is a way to maximize that. Um, the larger school is just a l sort of larger percentage of your inventory of space for the district, and therefore you'll have a larger, more efficient building to operate um, from an energy point of view and, and from an operational point of view is another way to think of it. And, and similarly, then, more elementary school students, a greater percentage of your population, would benefit by being in a new school if it were larger, is, is a factor to think about. Um, the rebalancing um, aspect is a little more subtle, um, but if you think about it, 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 it makes sense. If you have a smaller school where there might only be, say, two, um, two classes per grade, and you get a bubble of population, um, or, a, or a smaller, you know, group of, of second graders coming through that year, um, it's a, you, you have a little less flexibility with only two classes to, <coughs> to divide those students among. Um, if you have a larger school with 
four or five classes per grade, you can have a more finely tuned and you don't get, you know, larger swings in, in distributing children um, uh, in, in the grades and in, in the classes. Um, of course, it, w w the point there about ongoing improvements at Don Gibbons and Hanson are not, you know, directly related to this project in one sense, but we, we do want to remind the district that things are happening at the other schools too um, in terms of improvements there. Um, but there is sort of a, a, an indirect way that the other schools, that the entire town benefits by the, this school project in that, first of all, there, there may be freeing up some space at the existing schools by incorporating, you know, certain special ed programs at the new school um, is one way the other schools are helped. Just simply redrawing the district lines can better apportion students to, to those existing schools. Um, the new school can act more as a community center, perhaps than any of your existing schools do. Um, that's an opportunity that, uh, you know, the whole district benefits by. Um, reducing the overall cost of the district operating costs in the long run, but also the, the facilities cost too. The, the school committee a few years back uh, put together a school master plan that identified the high school was the most needy um, uh, facility, then I believe the middle school was next, then the South Elementary School. Um, oh, I'm sorry, the other way around, the South Elementary School, then the middle school is next, and, and then Wilkins was the next school, and then there's Hanson. I, and so uh, this isn't the end of, of, you know, facility attention that the town will need to undertake, but by doing a larger project, you do, you can pick off two projects in essence, and, and with the state reimbursement, it in the long run saves the district money. Uh, it is obviously a more expensive project initially, but it, it's um, uh, less expensive in, in the long run. And as we said, yeah, the new school can provide community-wide kind of amenities. It, it, it'll have a large gym. It can be an adult gym as well as a children's gym. Um, it can host summer school programs. It'll have air conditioning. Um, it can have uh, after-school programs maybe more, more uh, appropriately housed than uh, other facilities and so forth. So um, in, in terms of maximizing the grant, you know, we said that um, uh, more grant money, you know, can be applied to the elementary school projects with, with the larger project. So uh, this just uh, sort of elaborating on, on those points. But the last one too is, is worth considering. Um, we don't have a specific um, construction costs yet for the options, but we're working on that shortly. But even at a, a sort of high order of magnitude, um, we know that on a square foot basis, the smaller school is more expensive than the larger school. Or if you want to think of it on a per student basis, the smaller school is more expensive simply because, you know, the school, the smaller school still has a gym, it still has an art room, it still has a music room. In, in the larger school, it has those same facilities spread over more children. So uh, as you might expect, there's kind of a um, cost benefit to, to uh, spread the costs over uh, a larger building. Um, and then from an operational point of view, um, clearly there's the, the energy efficiency that we've talked about. The, the district would be operating you know, four, in a consolidated scenario, four elementary schools, one of which is very energy efficient compared to, to the existing schools. Um, uh, educationally, we, that's the, the issue about dealing with population bubbles, less disruption. Uh, again, this is thinking longer term. By having one construction project now, you're taking care of two of your elementary schools in a sense, um, uh, as opposed to having disruption um, you know, happening uh, a few years down the road. Um, and, and then also, um, you know, f the actual calculation shows that with the larger enrollment uh, consolidated school, about a third or more than a third of the students would be attending, you know, a new school. So clearly it, we, we know it, it still doesn't affect every, every family or every student, but it is a larger percentage um, for the larger school. And uh, conversely, uh, if the smaller school were selected, only 14% of elementary school children would be attending. Those are, you know, just to get the information out there for people know, you probably know yourselves, but there's ongoing work from safety and, and energy point of view um, 
at the DAW happening currently, um, just getting started this summer, and Gibbons is next, and uh, Hanson's getting a new playground, as you know, and also security upgrades there as well. So there, there are ongoing improvements at each of the other schools. Um, and I don't know, Joyce, if you want to talk to this one more specifically, being the uh, facilities person who can Thank you. talk costs. So really, one of the big benefits from my standpoint as I look at the budget is reducing the cost um, to operate the buildings. And I just did a really quick little back of envelope um, analysis of gas cost, natural gas cost, because we are expecting a big natural gas surge in prices next year. It cost 19 cents a square foot to heat the high school. It cost $1.38 a square foot to heat this building. So when I, I took a look at 19 cents a square foot and multiplied it over the, the 90,000 or so square feet of the, of the proposed combined building and compared it to what it actually cost to heat the South and Wilkins today, the two buildings that would be, um, there's like a $58,000 a year savings just in natural gas alone. That doesn't mean we're taking the Wilkins out of stock. We know there's things to do there. But there's a lot of opportunities coming up now with grant money. Um, to electrify buildings, and we're certainly taking a look at all of our buildings in stock to see the kind of improvements we can make for the long run. Um, other things that we can save costs on is this travel between schools. All of the schools of the, the South and Wilkins currently have part-time specialists in some of the positions. Um, they're traveling not in the three minutes between periods. They're taking longer. They're shared. Sometimes they're 0.8 instead of full-time equivalents. Uh, we can cut down on that kind of cost, have full-time dedicated staff to the schools, shared resources, um, the ability to eat, um, reduce the cost of multiple resources. You know, you have one library, one learning commons, one STEM center. You're not doubling all of the materials and supplies um, throughout. And this is all in accordance, as, as um, Carl mentioned, to the master plan and how it was laid out many years ago. Um, actually, that original analysis dated back to 2010 when the first mm -hmm. master plan was done. Um, okay. Do you want me to continue on this? Sure. You could. <laughs> okay. You want to. Um, we have tremendous requests and demand for our facilities, um, especially those that are of a size that, that they're useful to outside groups like Stoyak. Um, our DAW and, and Gibbons gyms are, are used extensively, um, but they're getting tired, and there's a, an opportunity sometimes to have to resurface floors or repair things or just to add additional resources for the community. And we're looking at the, the performance spaces, the cafeterias, the gyms, um, being really, really vital community sources in a, in a, in a new school building. Um, our library, our learning commons as they, as they are now, also the core and the heart of the building, um, neither the South nor the Wilkins nor the Hanson have what we consider adequately sized learning commons to meet the needs of today's makerspace, STEM, um, types of programs that are offered inside of a learning commons. Um, and athletic fields. Athletic fields are one of those resources that um, becomes a town-wide resource. The rec department actually permits our, our athletic fields on school grounds, um, and there is always a demand. Um, so the opportunity to, to build better, nicer, and uh, things that are attractive to the community. Um, okay, thanks. Um, so we also wanted to share with you what does redistricting entail kind of um, in terms of the process and the considerations if you were to, to uh, entertain the, the consolidated um, uh, larger school. We, we do have a consultant on board, um, Matt Cropper is his name, and he's kind of a national well-known figure in, in, in school um, placements and, and uh, districting and so forth. Um, um, and just to share with you the, the sort of process that you could go through, and, and again, you should keep in mind um, the decision to go to four schools from five does not mean that you have to make the decision on how to draw the district lines, you know, this summer. Um, it, it'll take us uh, a couple of years to get a new school in place, and and you could really wait till the year before the, the new school is going to open um, to finalize and, and have more accurate data as to where the families are with, with children and, and, and draw the district lines at that point. But we want to show you that some of the thinking that goes into it um, uh, and, and, and some of the variables that you can consider, you don't have to finalize them now. But 
the, the map um, is your current districts, the colored map there, A, and the, the, the uh, map on the right, uh, B, is, is what they refer to as a heat map because it, it sort of looks like the thunderstorms on the weather maps, but it's showing the density of student population so you can see where students live in town. It, it helps when thinking about, um, you know, in addition to other factors, obviously you want to know where, where, where students live. So on a very preliminary basis, um, we've worked with Matt Cropper to come up with four different um, redistricting, uh, very preliminary options to show kind of the variety that's possible and, and some of the factors that influence each of them. So uh, again, the colors are, um, you know, the, the four different elementary schools. The green would be the, the new South Elementary School. Um, uh, the purple is Hanson, the, the red is Daw, the yellow is Gibbons. And so you can see they're fairly, you know, significantly different possibilities as to how to divide the town. And among the, the possibilities that you'll notice immediately are, you know, the way it follows certain transportation lines and, and roads for safety, uh, of course, and, and in catchment areas, um, things like that. But the other things that they consider that you might not realize that you can somewhat control in, in looking at the variables are um, the utilization of the buildings. As we said, by drawing district lines, you can um, optimize the, the enrollments at each school. So no school is oversubscribed and no school is, you know, undersubscribed. You, you can even that out. So that's, that's certainly one. You can look at demographics. The, the census data is available on families and, and, and so forth. Um, and again, the, the, the way that they think about it, they suggest that a district think about it, is you, you might want to look at the town-wide average of these certain characteristics and then see does each school district, you know, fall within close proximity to those averages so that there are no outliers. Um, you can look at, you know, English language proficiency as another um, measurable data that um, again, that no one school is, is disproportionately represented with that. And you look at the percentage of students impacted. In other words, how many um, families or how many students would have to move from the school they currently attend to attend a different school. Not necessarily the new school, but a different school. And that's another factor that, again, you can weight these the way you'd like. There's no good or bad or um, it's how you want to think about it. Um, so you can see even the four options that we just shared, how they impact the different numbers of students. Uh, option four, 35% of students would have to move from a current school that they go to a new one, um, whereas the others are up at 41%. So that's fairly different. It's something to, to think about. Likewise, those other um, characteristics are, are represented with the, the green, yellow, red um, uh, colors where um, uh, green means that that the um, that characteristic is falling within the average of the town. Yellow means it's it's between 10 or 15 percent varying from the average, and red means it's significantly varying more than 15 percent. Um, so in um, many of these options, um, they're all green, which means the districts could be drawn so that they're all kind of similar characteristics if you want, and I don't think any of them had any red. See, there, there's the um, four options and different character, uh, different um, factors. This one's uh, enrollment and utilization. So all schools are falling. Uh, you might be able to see those numbers there. They're basically within 90 to 100 percent of, of capacity um, based on, on the way the current population is distributed. Again, you could wait, you know, to we get closer to opening a new school um, to make that decision. Looking at English language proficiency, currently right now, there is one, the Wilkins, that is a little bit different than, than the average, but with redistricting, they could all go green. And, and all, you know, those students, by being redistricted, are kind of evening out the, the um, percentages at, at the four uh, new districts. Um, with student impacts, this, this one is another one, uh, another piece of information that you could have available to show, um, if we just start at the upper left, how many students currently at the DAW, where do they go in the future? You, you know, uh, 230 of them stay at the DAW, 
122 of them go to the New South School. So that's just uh, a factor, and you can see that kind of data can be available for, for any of these options if you want to think about that and, and see where, where students are going. And obviously the community at the time would be interested in, in how this affects uh, them and, and so forth. These are just preliminary numbers for these preliminary options. But to give you a feel for the, the data that's available, here's that um, demographic free and reduced lunch um, families and, and students. Right now, again, you can see the Wilkins. The top one is the existing um, five schools. The Wilkins does fall below the, the town average in that characteristic, but with redistricting, um, some of these options, you, you know, are equally distributed. Uh, some still have a few that are marginally different. And then one last piece of data, I think we might have shared this with you before, is, is about, you know, what's happening across the, the state. The, the chart on the right there is um, uh, for the past four years of all new schools funded by the School Building Authority in Massachusetts, um, and how large are they? That, that, that's the enrollment. These, the, the grade structures may vary a little bit, but most of them are, are K to 5. There may be some K to 4s and, and some other outliers in there, but they're, they're basically classified as all elementary schools. And, and, you know, for our consolidated school that we're considering here, the, the capacity is going to be around 600 or so. The actual design enrollment would be 515. And even though you may think that's large because we're combining two schools, when you compare it to the data, you see it's actually smaller than the average. Um, so even the combined school is smaller than the statewide average. It is, again, just a piece of data. Doesn't mean it's good or bad, but um, you, you can see where the, the trend is. So I, I know that's a lot, and um, we just want to take this opportunity to, to you know, get the you know, consolidation and the redistricting issue kind of front and center, um, both on your agenda and obviously in the community too. It is such an important, you know, um, uh, factor, and it's and it's a decision that we'd like to have made. Now we we've taken um, the time to to extend the schedule to say make this decision this summer as opposed to having to make it next month um, in in June, um, extended by two months to. Um, submit to the, the state in August. So before we go on to any design issues, uh, um, just thought if you had questions about all that, uh, the consolidation or redistricting, uh, it might be time to uh, take those now. Thank you. I just want to make it clear to the public, I know we've stressed this time and time again, but this is all very preliminary. We are not deciding on a district, a redistricting plan tonight. There will be much more community input, um, much more looking at that. One of the, the main question before us is, is redistricting possible in a way that makes sense, um, that, you know, takes into account demographics, takes in, into account the utilization of the buildings, that no building is overcrowded, no building is completely underused, um, you know, that our resources are, are divided in a way that makes sense. And the answer seems to be that yes, not only is it possible, but there are options. And so I think that's, that's the main takeaway for me looking at this data right now. Um, but I wanna open up to questions from the um, committee. Lindsay? Yeah, I just um, wanna say thank you very much. This is actually really, really helpful. I think um, there's sort of two decisions here potentially. It's like whether to redistrict and then how to redistrict. And I think that this really got it, both of them. Um, so just wanted to say thank you for that. Um, I think I just did not realize how much data was available with which to make a really informed um, district decision. So just like mm -hmm. appreciate all of those like examples there. Um, I was wondering, you all presented like a really thorough case for why we may choose to redistrict. I was wondering if you could touch on maybe some of the counter arguments that you've heard around like why it may not be a good idea or like um, like what you've heard at community forums and, and how you might respond to those. Um, I know that's not what you put the presentation together on, sure. but just like a, a really brief would, would be great. Some of this is, is in, uh, available on the website too where we, um, the recordings of the community forums were there and, and some of the frequently asked questions might get at some of the, the same issues. but. Uh, first of all, there's just the human nature of people wanting to stay at the school they they um, currently attend, uh, the families wanting their students to stay at, at the schools that they they attend. They've formed an attachment with the staff, and and um, 
w w with um, the ability to walk to school. They, they may lose that in redistricting, or different people may get to walk to school in the future than currently walk to school um, now. Uh, that's that's um, uh, something we've heard. Th there's a little bit of um, issue um, about thinking that it, it, they'd lose the small school feel of going to a, um, a consolidated school. In essence, uh, uh, people would think of it as a double school because we're combining two schools. But as we show, it's really an average size school for today's standards. But um, uh, we, in, in the thinking, we would. Um, still be maintaining class size. So th that's often a much more important factor than the school size is class size in terms of education. So once we clarify that, had some um, discussion, uh, I think some people's um, uh, hesitation was addressed uh, uh, with that knowing that class size could still remain small. Um, and that doesn't double <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a larger school. Um, uh, what else did we well, hear? I don't I think, know. I think one, well, the other one, obviously, depending on the audience and the uh, and the people that are making the comment, but it's obviously double the cost. So that's, I think, oh, sure. mm -hmm. sort of obvious to people, you know. Um, but I will say... Well, it's not quite double the cost. No, it's probably, said, right. right, it's not quite There's double the cost. There is some efficiencies, of, economies but of scale. it's, it's yeah. more expensive, mm -hmm. you know, significantly. And I think... But people should realize, and we've seen this the last two years, the high school was built, you know, when the high school was built, I think people thought that was very expensive. Now that's a bargain in today's construction. And that's not really a trend that's going to be stopping anytime soon because the, the nature of construction economics are that costs are just going to continue to grow quite a bit. Labor shortages in the industry are structural. The supply chain issues are pretty structural. So I think that's the... The, the, the other argument we hear. I don't know if others have. Uh, yeah. Give Katie the yeah. microphone. Can you pass that, Chin? Or take that one? Um, yeah, I mean, I think they, they touched upon some of the different reasons why going to four schools might not be the best option. I think some of the other things that we've considered, and certainly this is not a reason not to do it, but, um, you know, we spent. I don't know how long going over our school improvement plans and talking about the social emotional impacts that the students have and and clearly a large part of that is the relationships that the staff develops with the students and when you're talking about redistricting that that does kind of shuffle the deck a little bit and so that is definitely something that is on all of our minds and how to make sure that everyone's taken care of in a change like that and again this is not certainly I'm not saying this is a reason not to do it but it is something that I, I think it's important for people to know that we're mindful of um, because that will be a change you know staff will have to relearn not only students but the families and in all of the schools that would be left if we went to four schools and that's just something that we're, we're we think about all the time so um, I think the walkability was another common co comment that came up quite a bit people like to be able to walk to their school and that might not be possible if we if we you know shrink down the number of schools that we have but again I certainly think that the pros kind of outweigh some of the cons that have come up yeah, I mean, I think to a point, as we've, something that I think was important you just brought up, that with the school improvement plans being consistent from school to school, I think it also creates an environment where every school your child could go to in Stoughton, we're focusing on a lot of the same things. We're seeing a lot of the same trends. We're putting on a lot of a lot of the same, I mean, every school is unique, but the the baseline pieces are in place in all those buildings and the same issues are popping up that we're addressing in similar ways. So I think for that consistency piece, it's there. I think something important that we keep putting people towards is there's this really wonderful 70 plus page document that outlines why it's not just <laughs> a, well, I think, the, I think the point is a lot of people look at the big names of the companies and like again these are all wonderful people but they're not stoughton public school people even though i spend a lot of time with them now and so does katie um <laughs> you know that they took our plan and turned it into these models so i think when we hear a lot like we're going to lose the school the, the small school feel i would actually argue it's still going to exist there's just going to be more kids like that's all about the culture that's all about the way the building is put together it's about that neighborhood that, I mean I actually think you might have a more small school feel in this new building than some of the schools do now um, so I think there are a lot of benefits and I, again I'm I'm for 
whatever is in the best interest of kids. But I think that having spent the time that we did, there was really purposeful things that were put in to make the learning experience better. And if, I mean, I saw 38% of students could potentially be impacted by this new building. Like that's a lot of kids to get the things that you want to a lot of students. And so I think that's, that's important. Thank you all. I really appreciate that. I think um, that is a fantastic 70-something page document. Um, <laughs> I just, it, it's fantastic. Um, and also just like I, full transparency, live, at, if, I, if and when I choose to have children, they would be at the Wilkins, except that they may not be. So this is like, you know, close to my heart, close to my neighbor's heart. So I just like really appreciate you all addressing that. Mm -hmm. Armando, questions? Yes. Uh, statement first i think uh i think when somehow we'll, we lose the focus of what we were trying to do um so we always end up with the the bulk of this presentation is on redistricting and the concerns of the community we should always have um, a focus on the concern of the community but we're talking about building schools and the impact of the children once they're in that school um i i think perhaps um it's important redistricting, as Liz have said, um, but I think we need to refocus on we're building schools or potentially building schools, whether um, two schools or one school. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, I think our focus should be there, and I think the communication to the community should be on uh, the potential of these schools and the benefits that the children will have. Uh, for me, I don't mind if my kids go a little bit further if they're in a safer and better school. Uh, the, uh, as a taxpayer, I'm concerned that uh, it's using my taxes correctly. And I would f focus on um, what Joyce said about uh, the cost savings. Um, I do understand everyone wants to be have their schools next door to them or down the driveway to them. But that's not always realistic, uh, given population growth and so on. Uh, so I, I, my opinion, everyone, all of us, and hopefully the community, we can get refocused on the schools and the kids' uh, best, uh, best um, um, what do you say, best interest. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you know, this redistricting does have play in, in kids' best interest, but I'd ask any parent, would you rather go to a school that may be unsafe for your child and doesn't have the opportunities, the spaces, the science and space and so on, or would you prefer to go to a brand new school which is not only better for your children, but also better for your tax dollars? Uh, I'll definitely refocus, um, if we can, back to the, the structure, the bricks uh, and mortar. Uh, if I can say that, I'll probably get a lot of <laughs> comments for that. And the other, the other couple of other questions: Is this what's going to be presented in June? Mm. First, some some combination of this. Um, we still have um, information about the bricks and mortar, about the, you know the potential new spaces that are in a new school. But we we do want to get the word out there in the community about redistricting to make sure they're on board. Oh, definitely we want to do that. Um, I want to suggest uh, doing I'm just saying I think we should focus on that. Yep. And um, I was hoping also, uh, if not here, but in June 1, where everyone's going to show up to see this presentation, mm -hmm. that we redefine the problem, uh, why we're doing this. Mm -hmm. I think it's critically important uh, to hammer that home and remind everyone why we have to do this, because a lot of people are... Uh, don't seem to understand why we're doing this. Yeah. And I think uh, it would go a long way if we we have no choice uh, for all the community to understand we do not have a choice. We need to move forward. And what we're doing is making decisions on where to go. Uh, it, and of course, mm -hmm. we hit these forks in the road and we need the community to help us determine which road we need, should, we need to go for the school development. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing I would say that um, I have an 
an engineering background, and I look at this, and I've looked at this, and I've looked at this, and I've looked at this. And dates are great, and the acronyms uh, kind of throw me off. I have oh, to okay. look at those <laughs> definitions again. And if this is presented to the community, I think they'll probably have the same issue. Yeah. Um, and uh, Dr. Rob and Catherine and I just spoke a little bit of time at the town meeting about potentially formatting the presentation into steps and refocusing all of us, including the community, on where we are now. Um, of course, we don't know where we could potentially be going, but I think if we um, format a presentation in steps, we're at step one, I think it would help uh, focus the audience and also all of us to know where we are. And step two will take us to where we're going to go after we've completed step one and made those decisions, we enter step two. I think something like that, uh, usually internal documents would be expressed in phases. Um, so it keeps all the engineers and the managers yeah. focused. Um, I think if we do that, we'll be able to bring the community along with us because they will see the same problems everyone here will see they will be involved in the same decisions that everyone here has to involve uh, be involved and I think it'll be a, a, a better way to in my opinion to communicate to the community not only to communicate all of us if we can always see this is the problem and we must resolve it um, this is what we've done so far now we're in step two or step one these are the problems we're working on to resolve now and when we resolve them, it determines what's on step two, and so on. And it gives a, a, a focus, a framework in which everyone can concentrate to resolve the problem in the step we are now. Mm -hmm. And when we've made us those decisions or, or, or what we do in that particular step, we can then say we've exited step one from mm -hmm. the criteria that allows us to exit step one and then to step two and then we have a focus here again as opposed to I see um, the presentation or, or what the community is saying they're talking about this step and no one's really in my opinion uh, really paying attention to where we are and I think um, it might be a good thing to refocus mm -hmm. um, if, okay. if we can do that uh, Joyce um, your Behind the envelope calculation, mm -hmm. if placed here as only estimates, I think that goes a long way to, to see or to help our community know why we're choosing or we'd like to go a certain path. Mm -hmm. I think that's wonderful to take some of the data from the high school and, and show the comparison to the current schools. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, a couple of things. So first of all, like Lindsay, I'd like to echo, thank you so much for the data point. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for the data points. Um, extremely helpful. Data wonk, and that really helped me to kind of delve into a variety of considerations that I think it'll, it'll really help inform our discussions going forward and will also help inform our discussions with the community and address mm -hmm. maybe some of those concerns. Um, to Armando's point, I, I it may be helpful to remind them that we are actually at step three. Mm -hmm. um, you reminded me, I totally forgot. This was part of the master plan. I was a town meeting rep when we voted on it. So, mm -hmm. so that was kind of step one. Step two was the high school and, yeah, and the yeah. fact that this is, you know, step three. It's just, is this step three combined with step four right, or not, right. you know? So um, I, I thought that was, a, that was a great point. I very much would like to see the reduced construction cost per student. Mm -hmm. um, and along with the kind of back of envelope things, thinking about once again, if you were combining the consolidation, you talked about the efficiencies of scale in terms of construction projects. Thinking about what that construction cost might look like in a few years down the road, right, right. if yeah. we if we looked at redoing the Wilkins and and so I, I think once again to, to the points that have been made by um, my fellow committee members before, 
you know, being good stewards of the of the community's tax dollars and, and showing that that's really one of the things that is driving this as well as making sure that we have um, uh, the, the created the conditions for a really um, impactful academic experience for our students. So I, I think that would be helpful. Something that has not come up um, is just the impact that that consolidation may have on busing down the road. That would be super helpful for me because as a parent, it wouldn't be necessary, you know, walkability would be like, oh, that's going to suck. We have a routine. I'm really used to that. Wait, now you want me to pay for busing and how much? And I have three kids. Mm -hmm. So that can really hit people hard at a time when they may be struggling, especially when you look at the students that will be impacted in the low income levels there. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that I think we're going to need to give consideration mm -hmm. to as we go forward. Um, and I'm trying to make this as quick as possible. Uh, and I think the last question I had is just simply, it would be helpful for me to know um, kind of before and after, what is our capacity? Like what is the max number of students that we could cram into our elementary schools right now? And what would that max capacity be down the road, once again, showing an effective stewardship of tax dollars? Um, that if we do grow for some reason or we decide to go to school choice or whatever the future policies look like, that we have that bandwidth, that capacity. So those are all of my points. Thank Great. you. Madam Chair, if I could make one point of clarification. Yes. Uh, just to be clear, our transportation is free for next year. So that was actually one of the things we did oh. is we eliminated the fee. Of course, we don't need it anymore. My kids are like, but that's but I, awesome. But I do appreciate the need to look at routes and figure that out, but, but and, it is free. Yeah. But, and once again, the, that's still part of the school budget. Sure. Mm -hmm. So as a school committee member, I'm particularly interested in that mm -hmm. information. And it certainly would affect, you know, would we need more buses? Would we need right. more drivers? That's and so. Especially I know when you look at looking at that. special education and yeah. all of that as well. So. Thank right. you. Thank you. Fabian, questions, comments? No, I just wanted to um, reiterate Ms. Shannon's point with regards to speaking on behalf of the community. While I understand um, Mr. Barbosa's points about refocusing and everything, I just think that, like, you know, it's an adjustment for the family, so we do have to make sure that we definitely consider them and have them engaged in a decision. We'll have to move forward nonetheless. However, their buy-in and support for this is going to be crucial, and that's why we prolong the whole, you know, um, decision making and everything and you know just as a parent as well and from a bilingual community I know that you know we spoke about the attendance and how that's going to affect kids and walkability so I just think that we definitely need to consider all of that in making a decision so more work for you but <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> nonetheless <laughs> the community will appreciate it for sure okay <sighs> thank you um, I do want to be very clear that my child will be affected by this. So I am interested in the redistricting as a parent and as a school committee member, and it's going to be interesting. I, I know one of our, our favorite plans is going to affect me very negatively as a parent. <laughs> so um, I, I am definitely going to keep that in mind as we look into presentations, you know, the questions and concerns that I have as a parent um, whose child may be moved to a different school and, and that sort of thing. So I'm um, keeping that in mind. Um, I do want to ask the question of, um, the special education places. I know the redistricting is very preliminary at this point, but um, I know we, it, the information that um, the Cropper was working with and how that uh, incorporated the special ed places, and I know that we're, we're sort of looking at, and we are we're definitely looking at an increase in that population over the next few years, and it's growing almost exponentially along with our ELL population. Um, do we still have room to kind of push an extra special education place? I know we're already asking for a smaller class size than the MSC, our, our MSBA um, has, but is there any flexibility to kind of try to push in for more special education um, considering that we, we are looking at a growth and we're almost kind of bursting at the seams at some of our schools right now with that? Because um, I know that sort of fit into, you know, the as we were looking at the capacity and utilization that of some of their schools, current schools, we're saying, well, it does on paper look like we have more space, but actually the special ed classrooms are taking up a significant portion of that. I don't know if you had. I, I, yeah, we can start there. Mm -hmm. I think in terms of like general special education and inclusion, mm -hmm. 
I don't think you would necessarily be impacted in terms of classrooms because we also in all the designs there's like spaces for special education teacher the EL teacher in each of those communities mm -hmm. so I don't think you're you're told you're I think yes we can accommodate if the numbers can continue to grow and the plan for the new school would make sense in either version and that, that I, that's also true for our ELE program yeah we have space designated <clears throat> for servicing those students as well yeah, I think the, the question that I think you might be getting at is for the specialized programs and like right, the the specialized programs, programs. right. Are, are we going to have room for that? Because looking at having flexibility to potentially move those around, um, given a you know an increase in population growth that in one of those programs. I, I think our original the plan that we were asked to come up with initially was to house the current program that's between the South and the Wilkins schools, which is just at the South. So that's the language-based program. Mm -hmm. And we uh, presented a plan that would accommodate the language-based program plus at its highest enrollment ever. Okay. Um, which, so we went back, I think which it was then, which 15 then would years, allow, Right, which then would yeah. allow the addition of a room right. for that, to accommodate that, that mm -hmm. idea. Yeah. Um, I think we should probably, you know, look carefully at where the sub-separate programs are currently housed and talk about the potential of alleviating the enrollment in those buildings so that if the program is to stay in that current location, that then we're taking some of the other students out of there potentially. I mean, that's conversations that probably should be ha ha we should have, just so that therefore, as that population potentially grows, they're not in the position where they, they are currently. So I think those are all different things we need to think about. But in terms of the plan for the school as, the, as we wrote it, there are spaces that are able to be used that might not be full right away. Okay. Yeah, and I think when you look at those programs, you look at like the sum of the program's parts too, in that like, you know, a TLC program or an ALC program is more than just the, just the classrooms that are currently occupied. It's a significant amount of staff that are working with those programs, and it could even include some district staff that are housed in buildings due to different programs. So I think if you are to, think about the possibility, like, you could not interchange these programs at their current locations. Like, for example, like the language-based program could go into, for example, another building currently, it's smaller, but vice versa, those, like the way those are currently enrolled, that would not be a, a, a swappable or, you know, does that make sense? Yes, yeah, that makes okay. sense. Can, can I just can, add can a I, clarification? Can I, this is Chin Lin uh, with Ver Vertex. Um, the clarification on that uh, to, uh, to what I said is that the special ed program in the new building, whatever the size, will accommodate the population that is designed for. So therefore, that if we have the uh, smaller population, obviously, that is only accommodating for that. And in that case, then the, uh, the welcome will not be, uh, there will be no change uh, to, to, to that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If I could just provide a point of clarification too. I think the most important thing in building the new building is to provide the flexibility. So currently, you know, as Mr. Dorr said, we're, we're planning for the maximum, so we're planning three substantially separate classrooms and, and all the different spaces that come along with those. Um, but certainly as we're designing the building, when we get to that point, um, we could think about what would be involved in perhaps adding a fourth space or, or something like that. But the, the idea is not to make a decision now about what would necessarily be there, but to provide the most flexibility when it's finally built and to see where we're at in terms of substantially separate uh, special education programming and what makes the most sense. Okay, yeah, that makes sense, thank you. Now, I'm just <laughs> concerned and then thinking about that, but I think this all points to that there's still discussions to be made about the redistricting that we, we can't make mm -hmm. that final decision right now. Um, but there are certainly benefits to consolidating the school and being able to provide um, that space perhaps mm -hmm. more easily with a, with a larger school building and certainly having the support staff on hand mm -hmm. a full time with a, a consolidated school would definitely be a benefit. Um, any other questions or comments? And just to leave you with the, the designs that we're working with um, uh, uh, are still being um, considered and evaluated by the, the building committee. Um, Three of the options you can see are, are on the line lumber site in different building configurations. The fourth option is is addition renovation to the existing uh, school. 
um, which has challenges in and of itself if it were try if you were to um, uh, want to consider the larger consolidated school it's a very tight site and and doesn't lend itself to uh, the circulation uh, for cars and buses and um, on the site the additional uh, outdoor space needed and and so forth so it's really limited to the to the uh, single school replacement option there too but the building committee is evaluating these options right now and looking more specifically as to you know which building configuration best addresses that wonderful education plan um, and and also works with the site so um, just to leave that with you but um, that's what we had tonight thanks for your patience and Thank you very well much set. for, for, for you. your patience and waiting to present. Okay. Any more final questions, comments for the building? No. Thank you. Thank you. The next one coming up is at Gibbons um, on June 1st at 6 p.m. Um, and then there is another school committee meeting, um, again, public meeting. And Matt Cropper will be available for that one remotely. But to get into more depth about, uh, you know, some of these issues and um, what you can consider um, in a redistricting process. So we wanted to make him available. So those uh, that, uh, again, is, I think, broadcast live, your meetings on yes. cable. So available to the community. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it will be recorded for future broadcasting purposes. So people there will be able go. to play it back. I will put it on the website. So thank you. That's been great. Yes, thank you very much for thank all you. the work. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, all right, um, moving on to other matters. Uh, a couple of things I wanna mention. Uh, we all received invitations from Mr. DeRosa, for the Stoughton Academy Director, to the 28th commencement of the Stoughton Academy on Thursday, June 15th at 6 p.m. in the Stoughton High School Auditorium. I wanted to thank Mr. DeRosa for the invitation. Um, I'm delighted to attend. I, I hope you've all RSVP'd. <laughs> um, that was a very exciting uh, ceremony last year, very, very moving, so um, looking forward to that. Um, the next item is the, um, the school committee received six emails from eighth graders at OMS as part of their civics project. And we wanted to take some time to thank them for their work, uh, for reaching out to us. I know that sometimes it takes a lot of courage to reach out to adults <laughs> who are seen very far away. Um, but we wanted to kind of look, touch on some of the issues that um, they, they did and let them know we have read your <laughs> letters. Um, the first one we had was about school safety. Um, and we actually have great news. We, our town meeting article on school locks that you guys requested did pass, <laughs> so that's great. Um, so hopefully those door, those door locks will be all repaired. Um, there was an issue, they mentioned some blinds. Um, I'm gonna refer that to. <laughs> sure, no, thank you very much. That is something we're absolutely aware of. Okay. Um, the middle school blinds are inconsistent in terms of how they close and open, and that's something that Mrs. Husseini and I have been discussing. So. All right, great, thank you. Um, and they mentioned they wanted more practice of emergency scenario drills, and I think that you guys did that today, so I hope that helps them feel a little less anxious and a little more prepared in the case of emergencies. Hopefully, we never have to use them. Uh, the next um, email we had was about guidance counselors and mental health. Um, and again, I think some of the issues were addressed today as they um, took up the uh, school improvement plans um, and talked about um, what you what they were doing to that for the um, for the upcoming um, school year. Uh, I know that we the issue of guidance counselors has come up before. Um, they mentioned the lack of diversity among counselors and mental health support staff. Um, it's just a statewide issue, unfortunately, and we just need to get more people through the system. Um, but I know that we did have um, actually Ms. Um, Sareva mentioned the change in from that, and can you touch upon that and. Um, Absolutely. So we're changing to the Italian Home, which is an, an op, it's an organization that will provide more counselors to us next year. And we're really excited about it because they can provide counselors in each building and provide counselors to families who may not have access to it. Um, so they'll be right there in the building for the students. And it, it accesses the students' health insurance, so it works out really, really well. Great. Yeah, and that was something that we actually asked you to look into, and you found that. So we're excited for that, and we will definitely you know, keep this in mind as the budget comes through. There's there's only so much money, but certainly next year we'll make sure that, um, you know, we'll look at the line item for the guidance counselors and the mental health programs. 
Um, we did receive three letters about school start times. Um, I know you guys did a lot of great research. There was some great um, statistics. You polled a lot of people. Um, there was a request to, for the start time to be pushed back to 8, a couple to 8.30, which is very optimistic. But um, I know this has been discussed. It's not something that we're actively looking at. There's a lot of logistical challenges, but I wonder if you could speak a little bit to you. To that. Sure, absolutely. School start time uh, comes up a lot, and I know that there's a lot of studies out there actually speaking to both, both sides of the issue. Um, one of the things when we consider it is really the impact K to 12. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's great to say, well, high school students would love to sleep a little bit later, middle school students sleep a little bit later, but what's the impact on our elementary students? And as I've researched it uh, in the past, there's always a big impact, again, on transportation, on trying to make sure transportation works uh, in a situation like that, and also on athletic because you know right now this time of year it's light out pretty late and so you can start an athletic event at four or five or six o'clock um, you can't do that so much in the fall or in the winter and so um, that's one of the other considerations um, so it's, it's one of those things that we, we certainly talk about um, but it's a big change district-wide to try to move start times and so we, we take that very slowly and carefully yes so you know keep Maybe you guys can find the research and tell us, you know, how we can do make the transportation work. So, you know, if you have an idea, keep looking. Um, our last letter was about outdoor basketball courts. Um, I did want to mention that I know that the students who wrote in have, are also talking to the select board, but I did talk to the to Matt Kushan, the rec department, about the Halloran Park, and so he is looking forward to your questions. He would like to speak to you about that. Um, I know they asked us specifically about the elementary school courts. Um, if could you speak to that, please, about Sure. So we just replaced the ones over at the Hanson. So last year we did have a situation with the Hanson ones had come down, and so we, we replaced those. Um, I'd have to look into the other elementary schools and see what kind of repairs might be necessary, um, and I can certainly do that research. Or ask Mrs. Hussein to do that research and really look at the, the basketball nets and, and hoops that are up right now and see what might be done. Great. I think that actually sounds like a great project for the Student Advisory Council, and so I encourage all of these students to run for the Student Advisory Council next year. I know you guys elected the board, but I'm sure you're soliciting input. Um, we had the Student Advisory um, Council was instrumental in the handsome playground, and so I think these would be great projects for them to visit. So uh, thank you for the letters. This was really, really exciting to see the students. There was a lot of great work. They were very well written. Um, and we want to commend you for your work and keep reaching out. If you have ideas, join the Student Advisory Council and we look forward to hearing more from you. <laughs> so, anybody have any other items? I actually do, if that's okay. Yes. I have a very brief um, update from the Pilgrim Area Collaborative oh, um, because it's time for the quarterly update. Um, so for Armando and Chris, I am the Stoughton representative on the board of the Pilgrim Area Collaborative, which is one of our special education collaboratives. We are a member district. Um, as I'm speaking, I'm going to invite Dr. Rab to just like jump in if I'm like miss speaking on anything that is just um, above my head. But um, just wanted to share, we met on May 4th for our monthly meeting and approved the budget for next year. Um, so that was exciting. Um, sorry, I apologize for looking at my phone. This is where my notes are. Um, but the we also approved like the fee schedule, um, hourly pay for extended services, um, the school calendar and the handbook for next year. Um, services, so this is sort of the thing when we talk about special education on our end, costs are up because of outer district placements. Um, so they are continuing, the Pilgrim Area Collaborative, they're continuing to see services um, with increased demand, including in, um, significant demand for in-home services. Um, they're receiving a lot of referrals. They're trying to be really thoughtful about placement and student needs, um, especially needs of already enrolled students. Um, just seeing a lot of increases in mental health needs, particularly for girls and young women, um, and just continuing to be creative about looking for ways to, to meet those needs. Um, the big thing about the budget, not to bury the lead, but due to the um, consistent increase in like tuition income because of the increased enrollment, um, as well as a significant one-time grant from DESI, PAC was able to freeze tuition rates for next year for member districts. Mm -hmm. So it's just an exciting way to not just be able to turn back um, money at the end of the year, but also be able to like help out member districts in that way. So I don't know if I have a ton more information, but would be happy to reach out to the director of the Pilgrim Area Collaborative to get more information if that's needed, but just wanted to share that. So are there any questions? I uh, that's wonderful news. I hadn't heard about freezing the tuition, so that's fantastic. <laughs> yes. We're thrilled. <laughs> More celebration. Yay. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. 
Any other? All right, I want to remind everyone that our next regular meeting is June 13th at 7 p.m. Um, we will be hearing more about redistricting, Hillary Moore from the Building Committee. Um, the next new elementary building school project public forum once again is June 1st, 2023 at 6 p.m. at the Gibbons Elementary School. And can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. All right, thank you, Chris. Seconded. Second. All right, thank you, Lindsay. Let's move and seconded. Roll call vote. Aye. 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 All right, thank you all for coming. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you all for sitting here.